Hello. Um, morning, sorry, we're just, just getting our text. <laughs>
Hey, Kareem, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. Okay, um, Julie, you, I think, got the list of sort of who's coming. Uh, do we still have a few more filtering in? You are still muted, Julie. Uh, Kyle's in a work meeting, and so he'll be joining us late, probably closer to two. Um, but who's missing from the South Shore community groups? Kathy Hankins. Kathy. She might have trouble getting on. Yeah, she did touch base, but she would attend. So. Uh, oh. Now, the Wi Fi out here at the lake isn't great. So if you see my video gone, I'm still connected. I'll just shut down the video. Makes sense. Okay. We prefer faces, but we don't need them. Uh, we're missing Rob yet, right? From the South Shore? Rob Pierce? No, I'm, oh, I'm he's, not, he's not coming. Okay. Oh, Kevin's not on yet. That's who's missing. I think he just signed in. Oh, there he is. Welcome everybody. My name is Nikki Thorstenson and I'm the Director of Communications and we just want to thank you for joining us again today. Some of you we've seen before at our Zoom sessions and today is our small group session but again by Zoom so sorry about that but uh, we just felt it was probably in everyone's best interest to stay safe and uh, still have the conversation though, and we can still see your faces. Uh, with that said, I know some of your internet's gonna come and go. So uh, we'll start with introductions from your side, from the screen, and then we'll move into introductions in the room. And then if you need to turn your video off, um, we'll have a face to a name at least to go by. Just before we get started, this session is going to be recorded. Uh, this is a, a group discussion, so there, there'll be no muting. We'll just be respectful that everybody has a chance to talk and, and uh, ask their questions and have their answers. So um, it'll be a little less formal than our other discussions, and we'll just have to be careful that we don't miss anybody's uh, hands up or, or a turn to speak. Um, so, Julie, if you'd like to begin introduction, so if you could, your name and then the association you're rep representing, that would be great. And wave a little when you do it, so just in case someone can't see you from far away like myself. I'm Julie Rutan, uh, Acting President of Roshan Sands Heights Community Association. 
Thanks, Julie. Um, Corrine? I'm Corey B. Crookshank, and I'm past president of Scenic Sands Community Association. Thanks, Crane. And uh, underneath, Andrew, I don't see it. Christina. Christina. I'm Christina Sylvester. I represent Abbey Road out of Scenic Sands. Thanks, Christina. And next to Christina in the Bruce. center, Hollywood Square. Bruce. Oh, I'm in the center. It's not in my room. Uh, uh, I'm uh, Bruce Olson uh, with Buffalo Lake, President of Buffalo Lake Meadows uh, Owners Association. Okay, thanks, Bruce. And then we have a counselor next to Bruce on our screens. <laughs> Takes me a while to unmute. Shri Neeps, counselor for Erskine Buffalo Lake. Welcome. Okay, and we'll go down to Justin. Hello, Justin Stevens, uh, Stetler County. It's not a formal uh, association. An informal association of our Stetler County residents along the Buffalo Lake South Shore. Thanks, Justin. And I have Craig next. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Craig, Director of Parkland Community Planning Services. Thank you, Craig. Um, Neil. Neil. Hi, I'm uh, Neil Milne, representing Roshan Sands Estates. Thank you, Neil. Next is Kevin. Your name on the screen shows as Jackson. Kevin. But I thought somebody said you were Kevin when you joined. <laughs> yeah, Kevin Maloney, president of Buffalo Sands Residents Association. Perfect. I'm using my son's laptop. <laughs> and then I see Kyle's also on the phone on, uh, but you are muted, star six on the phone. We'll unmute you. Hello, can you hear me? You bet. Okay, great. Yeah, Kyle Bruden Kate, um, Roshan Sands Heights Community Association, and I'm um, the director with the planning portfolio. And sorry, I wasn't lucky enough to get my kids' computers. Uh, they're using them for schoolwork right now. And so I get the computer without the camera. So that's why I'm not on video. So I apologize for that. Good, good sacrifice. Thank you. Uh, okay, we're going to move into the room here and we'll start with our Reeve and I'll just let you guys introduce yourself and sort of head around the room to the right. Larry Clark, Reeve for the County Stubborn. Oh, we, we can't see you though, I don't think, can we? Uh, you, our group really needs to wave because we're very small squared. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> Any gender settler? Big Grover, Big Valley. William Nixon, Red Rose, and Alda, and we are socially distanced. I don't think I have your mic like right. on the screen. Mike right. isn't quite close enough. <laughs> if, it, if you have to read me, problem about the uh, mic, Mike. Sorry about that. Wayne Nixon, Danella Red Willow, and I just want to add that we are socially distanced in the room here, approximately ten feet apart, I guess. So uh, it may not look like that on the screen, but we definitely are. Les Dulbert by Morandian. Uh, James Nyberg, Erskine South Warden. Jacinta Donovan, Director of Planning Services. Rick Green, Director of Operations. It's Fitzgerald, GIS Coordinator. Mayor McKenzie, Development Officer. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so today um, we just have a very loose agenda, but we thought we'd start off uh, with Andrew sort of summarizing some of the concerns and uh, considerations that we've been thinking of since our initial public engagement sessions have concluded. And um, then we'll turn it back to you as a group to add things that Andrew hasn't summarized. And uh, then we'll ask you guys to provide a summary of feedback, perhaps of what you've been hearing from your communities since uh, our engagements with them, and then just general group discussion from there. So Andrew, if you'll begin. Right, so I just took a bit of time to, to take a look through our notes and sort of point form some of the things that, that we kind of asterisk says needs follow up or discussion from our council. Uh, of course, we answered a lot of questions throughout. So there may be some that were more concerns that I've read is was just a question and figured my explanation was good enough. So uh, definitely add to this list if there's more, but 
Uh, some of the things we talked about as, as council discussing and taking for information is uh, the arterial road definition and setting some uh, clear expectations as to what the uh, three or four identified arterial roads will look like uh, down the road. Uh, we talked a bit about uh, boat launches, which largely falls into additional engineering, and I'm not sure uh, how much would change from this uh, draft, um, but it's something to consider. Uh, one thing that didn't come up in any of the public engagement, but it's it's something that uh, Russian Sands had identified early on. Uh, we should still show the, the Marie Lyle land uh, next to Paradise Shores. We show that as residential in the South Shore ASP, but it's currently zoned as recreation. So we'll have to rectify that one way or the other. And we're uh, waiting on hearing back from Lyle's on, on their input before we go rezoning their land or changing the ASP one way or the other. Uh, we talked a bit about uh, some of the walking trails that were shown, and I think there was going to be some follow-up that we would do on um, uh, walking trails that are maybe not as built that we had uh, mislabeled on some maps. So we, uh, I just didn't want to lose that. It may not be a discussion point today, but uh, something we'll deal with. Uh, there was a bit of uh, discussion and takeaway on possibly making some changes to the serving requirements of undeveloped blocks if communal water becomes available. Um, some additional discussion on ER and MR split, um, if we uh, need to further define how much of the reserve land that we've identified through sort of the, the overview maps, uh, how much of that may need to be split up. Uh, and then the, there was some discussion about the provisions around um, uh, non-detached non dwellings and, and what portion of the total development units could be non-detached dwellings. Um, so those are kind of the issues I, I thought came up that were question marks or, or could, could have more debate or more work. Uh, so we'll, we'll get to those in the discussion. I think the next step would be to open it up. If I've missed some, some key things that uh, the community groups were hoping for changes for rather than just clarification. Hello? Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, go ahead, Justin. Um, first off, I'd like to thank the county and uh, all the staff for uh, for putting the consultation together. Uh, it's been good. I realize there is a ton of work that has went went into this on your side, both in the development and the consultation side. So we do greatly appreciate that. Um, and as Regarding feedback, in addition to the discussions with our, our uh, members of each group, we also uh, came up with a survey for, uh, for our group, and it was sent out to everyone in the uh, South Shore, and uh, 12 questions, 13 questions, I guess, not... Uh, not a lot of surprises here, and I can send the survey results to you, Andrew, I guess, once this is over. Um, I can kind of recap the, uh, the survey a little bit just to provide some insight that this is a fairly large group giving feedback. Uh, we had 174 individual responses, which I was a little bit surprised by how many people participated. Uh, question number one, density and scale are of primary concern for future developments and 94% either strongly agree or agreed. Limiting traffic through residential areas is important. Once again, 95% agreed or strongly agreed. Buffering between various land uses is important. 92% either strongly agreed or agreed. Um, so in my mind, those are kind of all related to one topic in that density scale and, 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 uh, the mitigating factors around the density and scale of future development. So it, it does seem like it's a, uh, consensus amongst all of the South Shore that those are key factors. Another one that would be directly related 
is uh, compatibility with adjacent developments. That was 92% either strongly agree or agree. Um, so we also have some more, um, and I would like to give some kudos to the plan in regards to uh, Question number 10, it is important that developers contribute to infrastructure. Uh, my interpretation and reading of this area structure plan is that seems to be stressed quite a bit. And I am, all of us are happy to see that. So that's, uh, there, is, there is some very positive notes in the plan that we have noticed. Um, and I will, be sending the formal results over uh, at the end of the meeting, as well as the comments that came in from the various respondents. Thank you, Justin. We'll be interested to read that. I have a question for clarification. Uh, of those surveys, is it the community associations that are represented here today, or was it outside of that as well, including White Sands or other areas? Um, we, we gave it to essentially one executive in each association to manage for their members, uh, sending it out to their list. With that being said, we did open it up to anyone over 18 at one of those spots. So we, uh, surprisingly, uh, even in my group, we had some uh, variances between married couples <laughs> on the responses, which was kind of kind of interesting to me. Great, thanks, Justin. Uh, all right, do we have any more items to add to the list? I just have to have one. I'd like to ask him one question. Go ahead, Gro Dave Grover. Dave Grover. Uh, Justin, how many of these were yeah were actually in the, uh, for me to get a, a clear picture of this? How many of them were actually in the groups that are you representing here? Well, you're not one of them either. But and how many households? Um, like in a, in a, to get a proper uh, feel for uh, for this, like if it, was there was there multiples in one house or how how to go? I, I can give you, I, I don't have the exact breakout, but my estimate is this was approximately 100 separate households that uh, participated. There was some overlap with, uh, with uh, two people from one household filling it out. Thank you. Um, we, uh, if possible, we would like to add one more topic to the, uh, to your list, Andrew. Um, we would like to add, uh, bonds as well, whether that could be a requirement for major developments. Um, I've talked to multiple people in the county that have done developments, uh, some reasonably prominent people in our county, uh, Hayden's, Grandfield's, McDonald's, uh, Kathy Hankins, all of them have required, have been required to put up bonds when they did developments. And I would like to see that moving forward on major developments. And there is a definition in the uh, area structure plan of what constitutes a major development. And uh, I think that it is important, it is an important tool to protect the ratepayers in case something were to go awry, which it has in the past. Okay. We'll add that to the list for discussion. All right, so if that's, all of the discussion items we need to do then I guess we can roll into the discussion of it and this the the intent is kind of a back and forth or a, a bit of a you know live workshop uh, type concept so let's spin some ideas around and, and 
take a look at each item individually here. I think maybe uh, if we can start with the development bonds, um, that's the one I've got the least thought preparation on. So let's just jump right into it. Um, and partly because my first thing is to defer that and ask Craig. Um, so the, the issue here, I think then is specifically development bonds on uh, single parcel major developments is not something that the county of Stetler has taken in the past. Whereas as Justin pointed out, in multi-lot subdivisions, we always take a bond. Um, largely that has to do with the difference between the infrastructure that will be dedicated to the county. So roads, water and sewer that we eventually have to take over um, and, and complete those projects. If, if say a developer goes bankrupt in the middle of a development, but they've already sold lots um, before a certificate of completion, that bond is there to help us. Whereas we haven't done similar things with developments like a campground um, and would similarly be our current practice wouldn't be required for a hotel type development where all of the infrastructure is on site and private. Um, so Craig, can you speak to whether doing that is possible and where the appropriate place for that is? Sure thing. Um, so uh, I did see a couple other people in the room who heads up, you may be next on the passing the buck down the chain to uh, discuss. Um, so in area structure plan, just generally, we try to, we unfortunately we try to touch on finances, but we also try not to kind of bind or try to figure out the financial plans and policies for the next 25 years. So that's one of the challenges. And certainly bonds are a tool that some municipalities choose to use as a security for development, or as Andrew's mentioned, for uh, the construction of infrastructure that will be handed over to the municipality. Uh, a lot of that may be contained in other policies. Uh, so specific to you're going to build a road that you're going to give over to the county, that may already be built into the template development agreement, the contract that comes with that kind of approval, or a financing policy that uh, is already stated elsewhere. When it comes to a performance bond for private development on site, such as you're, you're going to build a parking lot, it's not going to be handed over to us, but we want to make sure that you do that in the landscaping properly. That could sometimes be a development security or a performance bond, which typically you would find in the land use bylaw. Um, in terms of the actual suggested tool of bond, and this is where a few others may want to weigh in, uh, I always view that as kind of the second best possible tool available. Uh, there's another tool for a municipality that's called a um, irrevocable letter of credit that comes with a lot less um, restrictions, is a more flexible tool for the municipality, is essentially doing the same thing. Uh, some others in the room may have uh, uh, some feedback on that as well. Uh, so just since I'm not sure if uh, you already have the performance bond for private development built into your land use bylaw. And I'm not sure if uh, Rick could speak to the standard approach to the infrastructure. Uh, yes, we have taken uh, irrevocable letters of credit in some situations. Um, generally, as you mentioned, associated with construction projects, but again, not for private uh, development on any parcel of land. So we don't have it set up currently in our land use bylaw that I'm aware of that we've ever implemented, but it's we are going to be reviewing our land use bylaw in the future. And so that could be something that could be added as a, a tool in the toolbox. Mm -hmm. uh, Jacinta, can I just clarify, did you say that there, in the land use bylaw, there is a letter of credits requirement for multi-lot subdivisions, but not for private? Well, or, sorry, go ahead. Go or is there any mention of letter of credits or bonds for any type of development um, in the land use bylaws? It's a separate policy that we have that for when you're uh, entering into a development agreement with a developer, there's security uh, that is required to uh, generally, because the roads do become county property for maintenance and other things uh, as well. So just to ensure that the proper, as Andrew mentioned earlier, when the um, developer fails to, you know, finish the development, we've had that happen, as you know. So the county has the, uh, and we didn't have enough security at, the last, at that time, but we do funds to ensure that the, uh, in the future, if, county has to take over the development, we have adequate deposit, security deposit to uh, pursue what is needed to complete the development. 
Thanks, Jacinta. Sir Nyberg. So, um, and just so everybody's clear about the difference between a development and a subdivision. And in a subdivision, it is public roads, infrastructure, water, um, wastewater, et cetera. So I'm not sure if we are even allowed to in most cases. Uh, for example, what I would think was the biggest development done in the county of Stetler within the last many years, G3, was it 35, $40 million? Um, I'm not sure how we would ask them to put up a $20 million bond and why would we even try and take something? So there, there's got to be a little bit of work done with that. This isn't a, a clear cut. Um, if somebody built a, if somebody wanted to build a, a $1.5 million house, we're not going to ask them to take up a, a bond to build that house. If they don't finish it, that's on them, their bank, their financier, whoever that deals with it. That's not our business. But if it is infrastructure that belongs to the county and they don't complete that infrastructure, that becomes our interest in any development. So a development versus a subdivision, that definition has to be made clear. I don't want anybody to go away with a misconception what a development is, and what a, a subdivision development is. And I think we have to be very clear in some of that, if uh, what we as the county can do and when we can take bonds. So I, I hope I'm clear. And if, if uh, you still have questions about that, please ask, because I, um, we have to be very clear about that. Everything that Justin spoke about was a pretty much a subdivision development. Um, and when we're talking large scale, when we're talking and the elephant in the room is Paradise Shores, I'm not gonna beat around it. That was not a subdivision and that's the crutch of it. We cannot take bonds on them because we're not responsible financially for anything they do other than public infrastructure. So. Um, <clears throat> was the county not responsible for uh, sending crews out to do storm drainage work and pumping water, looking at erosion. And I agree with what you're saying and the risk when there's public infrastructure involved is substantially higher. But I'm not suggesting that when you come to a major development using this area structure plans definition of a major development, so that would exclude individual residents, which seem to be a concern. Well, yeah. Just um, they're, they're not responsible to go out there and do that. We did that on at the behest of most of the people at the lake is why we did that. Uh, understood. No, no, no one wants to see subdivisions flooded out and, and the county stepped up and, and took corrective actions to mitigate this. But what I'm suggesting is just because there is not public infrastructure involved in a major development does not mean that there is not risk to the county or its ratepayers. Larry, here uh, on that on that same note, though, as Jane said, we did charge the owner of that property, and like anything else with the property, if they do not pay it, it would go onto their tax roll. So, from a risk basis to the county, it would be the fact of it would, you know, you'd have to work it through the tax sale on the property, but we, we would get the money back for doing that. Uh, we went through what we thought were the proper channels and what to do with the water on that site, but we decided at the point to do something different to better handle what we felt the water was. The easy solution would have been to throw a, a pump on it and just pump it over the edge into the lake is what our approval was, but we put it through a filtering system to, to make sure we had as little, the least impact we could. So but it's still, it came down to that fact that was something we felt we needed to do, but yes, we will collect on it. So from a risk basis, it wasn't, wasn't a terrible risk to the county. Yeah, there are some instances, for example, gravel pits uh, is one we deal with way too much. Um, and they, uh, they do require reclamation security, either posted through us or AEP. Um, those are the only private developments that we currently require a bond on. But as, uh, as was mentioned, it's something that will we can look at through our land use file. The ISP isn't where it's going to be one way or the other, um, similar to our enforcement and starting with without the benefit of a development permit. Those are all things we've, we've tightened up through our land use bylaw and I think we'll continue to look at. Um, 
Yeah, it's it's always it's 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 tough to find the threshold. It's it's about the intent of what what the bond is for, right? Under a, a subdivision, it's really easy. It's it's to make sure that the municipal infrastructure is completed. Um, and you know, when do you give the money back? Is the other side. In that case, it's after a certificate completion and a two year warranty as perhaps. Theory has a comment. Um, I'd like to comment on um, there's still in any uh, development period, if it's if it's multiple lot, whether it's a campground or whatever it might be, there's an obligation for the developer to meet the criteria of the development permit, the land use bylaw, all of that that factor even at the asp level or the the uh, we've had some experience i'm i'm the president of a homeowners association in in the city of red deer and uh, we were annexed into the city uh the developer um they're a little different scenario municipal government act has a whole bunch of criteria in that 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 says when you're annexed here's the things you have to follow um developer didn't follow any of or not any of them but a number of the they were supposed to preserve trees they didn't preserve trees they were supposed to have similar size lots to backed on to our development they didn't there's was a whole raft of things that in the neighborhood area structure plan which is a more detailed plan that they did not meet um no recourse city didn't do anything because they were worried that they couldn't it wouldn't hold up in court those kind of things so there is there's still an obligation there because they're building under your guidance in the sense of your uh approval process and here's what you have to do to 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 develop here so i think i i, I still think there is some credibility to say that well hey we want to make sure you're doing it the way you're supposed to yeah, and I, I definitely agree with that. And I'm just going to jump in and, and speak to that. It's, uh, uh, and with the development permit process, it's usually on the back end that we deal with that, the finances. It's when we seek a stop order and then a court order and costs recovered for that. That's how it goes through the, the tax. So it's a recovery after the fact rather than sort of a presumption that something will go wrong. Um, yeah, I, you know, why we do that for development and not subdivisions. I guess, well, I guess I don't know. So that's why I, I want to say it. I'd like to look at that one a little more. Um, yeah, and for sure, we've tightened up our line use bylaw for the enforcement side, especially with regard to, you know, starting things before a, a development permit's approved. So things like the example in Red Deer that, you know, if trees were a major consideration, which they often are uh, on private land, that that vegetation plan would be approved and they'd be required to follow that. They don't follow it. We issue a stop order. They don't want to respond to the stop order. We go through the court process, unfortunately. You can tell by how I'm talking about it. It's a long process. Um, it's definitely one we have undertaken, and we're you know uh, we're not afraid to undertake it. Um, but it's it, it's definitely I want to manage expectations. So. Okay, I have Councillor Gender and then CAO Cassidy. What I find is like if it's um, on private land, you can go do anything on there, and if it's going to be breaking any rules, it would then come into the environmental side. So like, I believe that would be totally out of our jurisdiction. It'd be no difference, Justin, say like, if you started to do anything within your own property and your neighbors disagreed with you, they would have no recourse. Neither would we be able to step back onto your land to be able to tell you on how to do yours other than your environmental. Yeah, Cassidy? One of the tools that we've had and we've used in the past and we continue to use in the future is the development agreement. Yvette, Yvette, I well, I can't hear you. Sorry. No. Oh, you're my... <laughs> no, I. Can... Microphone. <laughs> I, 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 I can hear you. Maybe nobody likes me. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. Often, yeah. Anyway, uh, one of the tools we use is the development agreement, and we've used it quite a bit. And so what happens is that's when a private development um, partners with the municipality to do things like access. Stormwater could be something, uh, utilities could be something, uh, shared roadways could be something. And what we do is we estimate what the cost of that will be, and then they have to post a bond or a letter of credit to ensure that if they don't do it, that the county then steps in and has somebody to complete it. And we've done that quite a bit, and we, we will continue to do it. Or Stolberg. Okay. 
Thank you. So I guess the, the long and short of that one is the ASP is going to be where that's going to be reflected. Um, it, it will be through the land use bylaw that any changes to that will be made, but we will we can look at it and look at how we're doing it. Um, it's it's a, yeah, it's just definitely a challenging concept. And, uh, Can't oh sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Can you, can you, uh, you talked about you use them regularly for multi lot subdivisions, but can you legally use them for other types of development? Is, is the county just choosing not to at this time? I can't recall, to be honest. Craig, can you speak to that one? Or just... uh, certainly. Uh, so, actually, and to go back to some of the other comments. Uh, so, the items that you can deal with when it comes to public infrastructure, like a subdivision or a new road being built. Uh, up to on-site parking, those are clearly defined in a section of the of the MGA that says you can get a development agreement and you can, in that process, use securities. The other, for private development, would flow literally from your authority in the MGA to put that in your land use bylaw. And the typical practice, uh, although I admit it uh, from what I heard somewhere, uh, some installers actually do take the bond based on the entire private development. In my view, that that is actually incorrect. What you should be doing on private land is looking at the things that are critical for the public aspect. So if part of the approval was you're expected to provide this landscaping strip or belt, we wanna make sure that that landscaping strip or belt is built per the development permit approval. So the bond or security would only be on that landscaping strip or belt, not whether or not you actually installed the marble countertops in your dream home. That's not a public interest. So can you legally do it? Yes, uh, you do have to uh, focus on what's important for the public interest as opposed to intruding too far into private. And this is a policy decision too, in terms of at what point do you reach an economic point where you, you actually uh, dampen the spirit for having more development because it does impact costs and uh, the ability to go ahead. Councillor Stolberg. Uh, one thing to remember, though, is on these uh, requirements of large bonds on projects, development projects, we uh, we certainly don't want to make that it's so onerous that it it uh, it scares away developments in the county, because uh, that could be the deciding factor. If they can't come up, I mean, they have a lot of costs before they start anyway. Plus, this bond and stuff. It, uh, we certainly don't want to discourage development within our county. And councillor Gender. Yes, I have done a few contracts with the county sector in the past. Yes, I've had to bond 100% of what that job was. So it very much puts the onus onto the contract to be able to do everything by the book. And if you don't, they, you've got bonding that they just come in and collect on. So like, are we going to, like Mr. Stolberg said, are we going to put this onus onto the private landowners or private lot owners of the same requirements? to put on the, the same type of bonding and hold them to the same type. I believe we're infringing very much, too much onto the private property side. Jacinta. I was just gonna add to the discussion that the stock order was effective. We deemed that the Paradise Shore site was unsafe and could be a public safety concern. So the stock order that is still in place address that concern and has uh, Craig mentioned the bond would serve that purpose. So since we didn't have that um, bond in place, we were able to act on the stock order and shut down the facility until they brought the property into compliance. So we did have some tools that we could use and are still being used as you know. Or gender? I guess I've just got a question back to Jacinta. So like if we saw uh, on a private property of where there was being unsafe or something that we found, could we put a stop order onto them right away also? If it's deemed to be uh, safe, unsafe to the public, yes, that is what we would use in the, currently because that is what we're, the only measures we have at the time for those types of development. And Kathy Hankins. <clears throat> Kathy, you're still you better when you need yourself.
There you go. Yes. Um, sitting back, reflecting on this and the developments that I've done, of course, um, I did have to post uh, bonds or um, irre irrevocable letter of credit. Um, I believe that anybody doing a development of whatever kind, and I can certainly appreciate your points about if somebody is building a home, that's a whole different situation. Um, but one of the things that I haven't heard in any of these discussions, and I'm sure all council, as well as all the people in the area, um, are very cognizant of the number of dollars that were not paid. As you said, uh, Councillor Nyberg, the elephant in the room, the Paradise Shore situation. Um, I do feel that for trust and for keeping our town businesses safe and other businesses safe, et cetera, that we have to come up with some kind of a solution, a legal solution uh, that we can be sure that our people who are supply doing the work and supplying um, materials, et cetera, can be protected. Um, that's maybe a, kind of a feeling thing that I have. Uh, I feel very sad for all of those businesses that have lost money and the people that have lost money. So I think it behooves us all to come up with some kind of a solution to make sure that people are covered. Thank you. Kathy? Kathy, I got a bit of a response to that, Larry. Um, you know, we mentioned big projects in our area, big commercial projects like G3 and companies like that. We don't do that with them either. And it's, it's as a vendor, part, part of that, I guess, is checking up on who you're working for. So if we, you know, what we do and what we lay out in our policies kind of makes it to the point where we have to do it to every venture that we could, somebody could interpret would fall under that same umbrella. So uh, it, it is bad, but on the same sense, uh, I, I don't know how we could do that in these other big projects. So, Andrew? Yeah, the, the, so I think Kathy, what you spoke to a bit there was, uh, was protecting uh, the, uh, the builders and the contractors. Um, and unfortunately, I don't think, especially with what Craig just described, that uh, our scope and our authority as a municipality will ever cover that. Um, we would basically only be able to take a bond to go in and complete works that were promised us that were for the public interest. Um, whereas, say, you know, in the Paradise Shore situation, all the electrical work that was done in there and then is, you know, sitting on the title now as a, as a builder's lien, I don't think any of the money we would collect, even if we had collected full securities in that regard, uh, would be able to be dispersed uh, based on building links. It's not, uh, unfortunately, uh, within the, the regulatory scope. Um, so yeah, as, as Larry said, unfortunately, that kind of has to go back to private business and through this court system, of course, is where the civil and common law uh, cost recoveries exist. Um, and yeah, challenging. I think we're all heartbroken by, by the local vendors that still have money owed. Uh, many of them barely skated by as a result. And unfortunately, there's very little, if nothing, that we can do for that to ensure that we have you know, good developers for paying their bills. We can only take them to task on uh, doing what we told them to. Thank you for your answer. Um, I just would like us to make sure that there isn't something more that we can do. If you could just check that out and be sure. Yeah, we've got um, a lot of research to do on this one. We'll include that to, to make sure that, that there's not some way we can do it and see what other municipalities have done. Thank you. I think we can probably wrap that one up then and move on to, um, do we, are we going in backwards order, Andrew? No, we can, we can go wherever you want. Let's go back up to number one, arterial roads. <laughs> okay, so this is probably the biggest one. Um, we've got in the plan a few different arterial roads identified uh, for future use. And of course, the big question has been, well, what does that look like? Um, and of course, uh, in many of the sessions, 
um, particularly after the first session, both the Thursday sessions, uh, we spoke a little bit better to you. Clearly there's some additional definition needed here. Um, and we've, we've talked a bit of in, in our group administratively about you know, what could that look like? Um, so I'm just bring up the right document here. Um, and really, uh, we, we do want to get away from uh, having to rely on a series of policies um, to try and interpret what it means, because we want some consistency and understanding for all of the uh, developers and the, the public. So, you know, Kyle, for example, brought up uh, our policies 2.17, which speaks to all engineering infrastructure, um, but and, and says that the Ranger County standard shall be a minimum, whereas our or specifically our roads infrastructure standard has certain exceptions to that. Um, and, you know, it's a massive interpretation and I, I don't necessarily want that to be the case. So, you know, I, I do want to take those policies back to council, uh, amalgamate them and clean them up um, so that there's not this interpretive nightmare to, to do where you have to follow, okay, well, this one is the general and this is more specific and the more specific prevails over the general. Um, I'd like to get away from that. Um, so expect to see those policies and when you're upcoming committee of the whole meetings. Uh, but beyond that, we maybe just want to talk about what do those roads look like um, in the future. So there's uh, 21-1, uh, Range Road 21-1, Township Road 40-2, and Bayview Street, and then either Range Road 20-4 or Range Road 20-5. Um, and Rick, you provided us some comments. Yeah, sorry. sorry, Andrew. Can you say those roads again for me? Yeah, um, 40 that actually, and I can share my screen here. Let me do that too. So we're all looking at the same map. This is page 62 of the Buffalo or the South Shore Area Structure Plan, the proposed document. Um, so this is what I always call the main map, map A. Um, it okay. shows a lot at once. It's um, not up there, Andrew. Oh, you guys aren't seeing it yet? Yeah, I can see it. Yeah, I could see it. Um, so Range Road 40-2 is the main uh, lateral road from east to west, Old McDonald's all the way over to uh, either 20-4 or 20-5. You have the, the options, future arterial option, as you can see it's shown there as a future option to be determined as either 20-4 or 20-5, not both. Um, Range Road 21-1 is the main uh, arterial for the west side uh, from the south to north connection and then uh, Bayview Street from the Buffalo View Estates subdivision east to the uh, Ranger 20-4 and up to the White Sands Road uh, would be the last uh, arterial that's proposed here. Um, and probably one of the things to note is, you know, we call all of them arterials and they probably all don't look the same. Um, you know, when you look at the range road options to take you all the way from 601 up to Bayview Street, um, likely higher speed limit than what you would see in Bayview Street. So maybe if I could turn it over to Rick and throw your thoughts, if you're prepared ish, um, to talk a bit about what you would see those roads looking like and what some of the, I guess, some of the priorities you would make in establishing it under the specific environment, whether it's speed limit surface or you know, subgrade, that's sort of your priorities. Okay, so, so one of the things I've heard a lot about is the concern about traffic through residential neighborhoods and whatnot. So when we have all these feeder roads connecting midpoints and whatnot, I think uh, from a functional perspective, the more outlets we have away without traveling people through uh, provides probably more of the continuity that people are after. So we have less of the traffic that's resident in the neighborhoods traveling through the neighborhoods to get out so the more outlet points we have the better from that perspective and also the more outlet points we have from an emergency management and um, municipal services perspective um, it's also easier to uh, manage and maintain things that way so that's sort of one of the concepts i've heard quite a bit the the thing to remember the county in general is a varied area that is generally um, rural um, gravel road cross-section type environments, virtually gravel highway type environments. Um, so the broad definitions that we have for road classifications throughout the county 
are fine for 90% of our roads, but are not necessarily directly applicable to a hamlet environment or to a specific quote unquote lake environment in this case, where we have to take a look at each of the environments separately, which is one of the reasons there's an area structure plan being prepared here um, to deal with the specifics of the environment. So the one thing that we're missing, I think, is in this plan anyways, would be the conversation about defining what we want the roads to do as far as what their classification names are. So from a broad Canadian or Alberta basis, um, an arterial road, and even in the rest of the county, I guess, an arterial road is gonna have a different meaning compared to what a build out of this, um, this growth node area at the lake would be. So altering a definition in my mind would make a lot more sense than changing a name to produce a different function because we have standard um, uh, classifications throughout Canada. And the biggest thing to remember about any of these things is they are general guidelines. They're not hard and fast rules. Everything in this particular environment requires judgment and applicability to the local environment. One of the things you'll find is most of our roads, um, or at least our standard cross sections for roads and the geometric requirements are very broad as well, based on a straight rural road cross section, eight to nine meters wide, paved or unpaved. So whether you call something a collector, an arterial, a resource road, or in a lot of cases, a local road, you may not actually see a difference in the actual constructed road. What's more important in a small environment like this or a defined environment is making sure that the concepts and the definitions are appropriate so that when we're doing a detailed design in the future, we consider traffic volumes, the emergency management access, uh, maintenance access, walking access, a um, whole bunch of things that would go into how we want that road to function in the future based on the environment. And since we have a number of mixed environments where you could call something arterial or collector based on one set of criteria, but you could also call it local based on the fact that it's also servicing residences, that's where the judgment's gonna be applied. So we have to think a lot about the function, the definition and the local environment when we get into it. Does that, Get us anywhere close to my manifesto from the other day, Andrew. I think so. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. Um, so I think you know some of the some of the things too to, to remember is you know, the the function of the road. Um, as far as the plan is concerned, one of you know one of the big things in identifying arterial roads is roads that will not have driveways on them. Right. That's that's important in setting expectations for developers to say if if this side of your quarter section is adorned with. Uh, an arterial road, you're not going to have driveways coming off some new residential lots directly onto that road. You're going to have to have them back the other way off of a local road um, just so that we don't have a bunch of intersections. We don't have an issue with, with, with that sort of environment. Um, you know, not always how it's shown up in the past, but it's definitely what we want to move to in the future. And then as well that, you know, you want your, uh, you want your road network to be able to handle the volume of roads. So, you know, when I look at the way Rick designs a road, it's usually Armageddon proof. Um, but you, you want it, you know, you want the the, the sub layer to, or the sub base, jump in at any time, Rick, but um, you, you want it all to be able to, to not get pounded out by the kind of traffic we expected to see. And so um, it doesn't make a lot of sense to have a tiny road that's got a light layer of gravel that's going to be taking, you know, 100 vehicles on a Friday night. Um, you know, maybe that's not even that big of a number, but. Um, that's, the, that's the type of thing we want to consider. I mean, Andrew, yes. we, the things we need to look at as well, very specifically, is we have a lot of currently undeveloped farmland, which we have a huge opportunity to very much define a new standard in that area or utilize existing standards. The handicap that we have in some areas are, are ones such as Bayview through Old Boland and whatnot, where what was there? 30 years ago to where it's going to and the current function versus the old function is a mixed environment. So you're going to have driveways coming on to a potential classified arterial road at that point, 
So now we have to apply the judgment and the design expertise to deal with all the mixed environments there that suit all the needs. And that can be some of the steps we've taken. And I don't need to rip the bandaid off too many wounds with parking and or speed limits and or separating out walking paths from road surfaces. These are all things we can use to make the environment safe and still accommodate the needs of the environment. So we have to be very careful. That said, the area that's currently undeveloped basic farmland, there's our big opportunity right now to, like Andrew said, to find an arterial versus a collector where you'll have houses on a collector accessing directly, but you don't want to do that on an arterial. You'll have them access from an internal road network. Uh, I, or the mixed areas that are already mixed. Councillor Gender, then Councillor Grover, then Reeve Clark. I see the way that, like, what we have to work with now are the existing roads that uh, in order to try and make this work for the time being. The problem that we are running up against is the south half of 19 and the south half of 20, we have absolutely no control of it. This is private land and it will not be changed anything differently until some more development changes. And then you are able to build more roads say like further south away from it. That's the only way that we will definitely be able to say that we can definitely have say like an arterial road well, they take all this um, impeded or this um, traffic that is next to Bayview Street. That's the only way that we're going to be able to get away from this, in my open, own opinion. Thank you, Councillor Gender. Councillor Grover. Uh, I, I was just going to talk to that extension that goes on past Bayview Street. But uh, for. Uh... Oh, I'm not talking to the mic. There we go. Okay, I got it. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, to let our fire or ambulance and that which we set on and we were quite proud of the job they do and stuff, it gives them another access to it. Uh, if we have a, a major fire up there, they'll have a way out of there. And maybe down the road, we'll have to widen that road or buy land off the, the other people. I was just wondering what the uh, thought was because you got all the, uh, all, of, all the people here now uh, that they do widen it and uh, do pave it, that they would maybe look at an offsite levy to so they would could pay for it. Well, an offsite levy, would, an offsite levy would typically be applied to uh, new yeah, development. New development, but I, what I'm saying is a new development. Why should they be hooked to build a mile yeah. and a half? Well, that'd be a local improvement tax that you'd be talking about. Right? Yeah, local improvement tax. Well, I, okay, potato salad. <laughs> Anyhow, then that way, then I wouldn't feel so bad because I plan on driving on gravel on my rest of my life, but I'm going to just say I'm still going to pay my taxes. So I, I think that they should, down the road, they should get that ball started to, so that, uh, you know, if they pay, if they pay it, then they, they use it, they pay for it. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Gender. Councillor Stolberg. I think with this uh, area structure plan being reviewed and uh, serving the needs of the South Shore area and, and with the future planning that's in, in place with our arterial roads, like for instance, uh, like Range Road 20-4 or one of those ones, it, it's it's designed to take the pressure off as the build out gets larger, to take the pressure off of 835 and the traffic going through the Bayview Street area, because then there's an alternate way out they can get down to the 601 and in future time once it's needed. So I think that the greater plan is looking at the bigger picture further down the road. And the definition is arterial, but as Rick explained, uh, arterial means different things to different people in, in different areas and different municipalities. But in this area, that's what they're called. And it, it's a way in and out. And you know, unless you'll, everyone owns a helicopter, you're gonna need a way in or out and you need to safely. And now we have Kyle Brooping Kate. to get myself unmuted there um yeah so i guess this is a big concern how bayview street is shown as a um, arterial road and you know my understanding and i brought this up at the other <clears throat> excuse me community session is that arterial roads are defined and the county of stetler does have a design drawing for what an arterial road is and that that's a road that uh, sits on a 
Um, I'm not sure. Can I share the screen, Andrew? Um, I'm not sure if it'll let you. Uh, um, I mean, I can, but uh, oh no, it's disabled. But it, but the there is one drawing that shows in the county road standard and the policy that you sent me, Andrew, of, of what an arterial road is. And you know, an arterial road is one that sits on a, a 30 meter right of way, and is about 16 meters of driving surface. So that that that's a pretty substantial road and also there seems to be some typical design standards of what an arterial road is supposed to do. The concern we have is that Bayview Street, as was mentioned, the old part was designed many years ago under an older standard to meet the, the needs of that day. Um, and it's in the old area, it only has about a 6.4 meter wide road surface. The new area that's built a little different by Buffalo View Estates it has an eight meter wide road surface um, on a 20 meter right of way. So it's the road is about half as wide as what an arterial road is as defined by the county standards. And the right of way is, is 10 meters narrower. Bayview Street extension that was recently built by the old Paradise Shores property. Uh, I'm not sure what the road surface is on that, but again, the road right of way is 20 meters. So the concern is, is yes, the road can be upgraded in the future, but there's some things that um, aren't easy to change or even practical to change to, to have it meet um, a arterial road standard. And the big thing there is the, the distance between intersections. On an arterial road, um, my understanding is you should, good design practice and the standards say you should have 400 to 800 meters <clears throat> between intersections um, and just in the Buffalo View States area alone there's four non-compliant intersections with that standard so and that's not an easy thing to, to change it's not like we can block off access to the streets that access um, the Buffalo View uh, Estates area of Roshan Sands Heights so the you know the other thing to consider here is is what I guess is the, the capacity that's needed. So right now, the old area of um, Roshan Sands Heights with a 6.4 meter wide road, um, it doesn't currently meet uh, even local road uh, standards according to the county drawings. And local roads are only typically designed to handle about 100 dwelling units is my understanding. Now, if you upgrade that to a collector road, it can handle up to 600 dwelling units. <clears throat> but the, uh, the thing is, is uh, defining, again, you know, the plan does correctly identify that our arterial road is needed, but I, I don't see how that arterial road can be the existing Bayview Street. Um, Bayview Street over the years has continually had load added to it um, as, as subdivisions get added, um, Buffalo View States, where I'm at, was the last one. And that put it to just over 100 dwelling units. So that basically maxed out the local, um, the local road standard. And the, even the road through Buffalo View Estates, in some aspects, doesn't meet local road standards or sorry collector road standards so really it's only designed to be a local road as well even though it has some collector road uh, aspects to its design so when we you know look at the the load that's being added with any further development we're certainly putting baby street past its capacity um you know if the the old paradise shores plan goes ahead um, you know, with up to 700 uh, sites or dwelling units or development units as this current draft of the South Shore Area Structure Plan allows for. And then you add the additional white sands traffic. Um, since the Bayview Street extension, it seems like Bayview Street is becoming the preferred access to white sands as well. You know, pretty soon we have 500 extra de 
development units from White Sands using Baby Street and potentially another 700 um, at this, uh, the old Paradise Shores site. So it certainly does need an arterial road access, but I just can't see how existing Bayview Street can be identified as that arterial road um, access. And I guess that's, that's really, uh, you know, a huge concern for us. Um, what I see in the plan is there is an east-west road identified through an undeveloped, the undeveloped land to the south. So to me, it makes a lot more sense uh, that as the developments continue, that that east-west road that's identified in the plan south of Bayview Street is identified as being an arterial road. So it can be um, designed from the start properly without having to make any compromises. Um, now, we still have an existing concern because as load has been added to Bayview Street, even today, it's it, it really the the Baby Street is, is deficient in a few aspects even today. So we think, you know, there are solutions to that that will also accommodate further development. Um, and that is that as is identified in this plan, Range Road 204 and Township Road 402 or 4, 402 or 40-2, really at some point, does need to be paved to Highway 835. Now, conveniently, the right-of-ways on these roads are already expanded beyond the standard 20 meters. So the, one of them's 30 meters, one of them's 40 meters. So the right-of-way is already there. Um, I know it's going to be tough to, uh, to, to justify that, um, but uh, at, at currently, certainly at the current time, but any future expansion we need to yeah, and you keep, need to keep that in mind. Um, or as the plan also shows, the other option is to take 204 to Highway 601. And that's great because it relieves some of the Highway 835 traffic. Now, you know, I also think that practically there should be a cost sharing agreement with White Sands on this because it certainly seems to be the preferred access route then. So if these range roads were, were paved, that that would be a preferred way for White Sands residents to get there, as well as to get to the uh, the west side of Stetler. And just one more point is, in the interim, to uh, you know to to try to keep Bayview Street within its capacity and not overload it, um, which the Bayview Street extension may do, and I guess we'll see with traffic counters just where the situation is at, is, um, and now I, I understand this isn't a preferred solution, as there's concerns with it, but I guess we're still not clear of why we can't, why there can't be some sort of um, emergency gate on Bayview Street. You know, I certainly know there's the concerns from the the emergency response um, people on uh, on that. However, I think we should also recognize that there's there's a concern and a problem with overloading Bayview Street as well, and that that presents its own issues. Um, so I know there I've heard that you know provincial laws says that, says you can't deny access to a public road. But I don't think that this gate does that because 100% of the road is still accessible. It's just traffic flow control. And it just um, means that the road is accessible uh, from each end instead of all the way through. So I know there's, you know, and I, yeah, I can think of a lot of examples where this does happen. You know, Highway 2, for example, all sorts of grid road intersections have been blocked off from direct access to Highway 2. So that's that's why I think that some sort of traffic flow control device uh, should be something to consider there. So anyway, I, I know that there's a lot that I went through here, but you know, main point is 
Baby Street identified as an arterial road to support future development. I just can't see that how how that how that works, and especially when I think there are other viable solutions. So I know that was long, but I'll leave it there. Okay, hey, thank you. I have Councillor Nyberg first, and then Councillor Nixon, and then Julie. Oh, Kyle, that was a big bag of mixed um, thoughts in there. So I'm going to try and separate that a little bit. So, um, and, and help me out here because, and I'm old school, so I call it the old Boland subdivision and then Bayview Street. So I'm trying to make that separation. And when you're talking Bayview Street, not handling the capacity, I think you're talking about the old Boland subdivision. Is that correct? Certainly Old Bolin is the worst case, but even by Buffalo View Estates, uh, the, the road, Bayview Street there is really only meets local road standards. Okay. So the way I read them. Okay. So that just so that I've got an idea. So, and, and I, I got another question for you. If we change the name of the road, would people stop driving on it? No, and that's, and that's why Okay. I'm suggesting there has to be traffic flow control until such time that a more attractive route is built, and that would involve paving the other grid roads. Right. Okay. And I, I hear that exactly. And we, I mean, our, part of it is absolutely, we have paved up to the old Boland subdivision, our portion of it. Um, and I mean, White Sands definitely has to come to the table. I mean, there have to be a major contributor to that pavement because um, let's face it, there people are going to be um, utilizing it as a public road, absolutely. Um, now, if we moved it, and I'm looking at the map that's posted, I'm not sure if you can see that, Kyle, but if we move that arterial road down to the one through the middle of the, the open quarter section, which we don't own, that's just a theory that road's going to be there. That's not guaranteed that it's going to be exactly there, but something similar. This is a this is a um, plan, not a um, it, it's not a policy that's put directly into place. I'm not so sure that's going to change anything in our 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 go forward plan. You're still going to see just as much traffic go by that. We could do that. We could move that down and put it in the middle of there, but that top road would. Um, still get used just as much as it it is um, being used going forward to this day. I don't think that's going to change the traffic flow. So um, I'm not sure how changing the plan is the solution to what you're considering to be the problem. So, and I'm not trying to, I'm not to diminishing what you're saying. I understand what you're saying. We have a lot of traffic by there. Um, there's something that maybe has to be done, but I don't know if changing the name or changing that's going to fix our problem. So, um, and I, like I said, I'm not trying to diminish what you're saying. I'm just, I'm just trying to help us help you kind of thing, I guess, and let's figure something else out. Yeah, I guess maybe uh, just to respond is, you know, if, if our Baby, Baby Street's uh, identified as the arterial road, future planners will look to you know make that road wider maybe but it still doesn't solve the intersection spacing problem however if you identify the road to the south as de development progresses then that will be the road that developers will build to an arterial road standard meet the standard without compromise and so when you have a road that is built for higher traffic and higher speed that will be the preferred route that people will take and you won't have the uh, the traffic that's overloading the existing roads, because you know people have said to us that if Bayview Street turns into an arterial road, you know either they're going to sell their properties or they're not going to build a house or they're not going to they're not going to invest as much. So I mean this this is a concern I think for all of us. Thanks, Kyle. I have Councillor Nixon. Yes, thanks uh, for your comments, Kyle, and. Uh, uh, it, this is something that, as council, we've been, it's been discussed since I've been on council, and that's close to 14 years, about the, you know, how you get past uh, Bayview Street, and we've discussed many different routes, and we'll, we'll continue looking at it. I thought Rick's explanation about arterial roads, or roads, 
uh, was very good. And uh, you know, it's it's what's in a name sort of thing <clears throat> that uh, has been dealt with, and it would it it will be it will be discussed and has been identified almost every I think meeting that we've had so far. Uh, and just help me out, Rick. How many miles of road in the county, Statler? I think around 2,650 kilometers. So what's that, around 1,800 miles? 2,650 kilometers, and uh, I think more in miles, and 1,800 and some <coughs> kilometers. Yeah. yeah. So <clears throat> those roads are part of uh, our responsibility as well, and we've got to, you know, do construction and rehabilitation and gravel and everything else it's it's a big it's a big ask uh and i talked the other day about it and whether you were on, on or not kyle but the the cost of pavement is about a million dollars a mile the cost of uh, gravel road and this is new construction is a, is about a uh, hundred thousand dollars a mile there's a huge difference so the, the money has got to come from someplace the budgets have been tight in the past few years and so We'd all like gravel. We'd love or pavement. We'd all love pavement, uh, but it's not going to happen in the in the near future, and uh, we, we just have to move on. But just to go back, the concern has certainly been noted, and by every councillor. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nixon. I have Julie Rattan, and then Councillor Gender. Uh I'm just going to explain a little bit a perspective from the residents that we are representing here today is Bayview Street definition is pretty important to the people who live here. And I've, I, I want to tell you a story when uh, this is when Johan was there and I, it was when there was all this talk about opening Bayview Street. And I said, well, you know, and calling this a collector road. And he, he said to me, well, it's in the Buffalo Lake South Shore IDP. And so I looked it up and sure enough, it was there as the collector road. And he said to me, if you didn't want that, you should have complained when we wrote up the Buffalo Lake South Shore IDP. So that has never left my mind. So that's why the definition is important to the people here because we don't want to see, we want Bayview Street as a connector road we understand we need it for a secondary emergency access, but we're very firm that the definition is very, very clear before this plan is adopted. And I'm just speaking for everyone who lives on, ba on Buffalo, uh, on Bayview Street. Thank you. And there, is, and there is a solution, as Kyle said, to identify an arterial road south of Bayview Street and leave Bayview Street as a collector road from paired, well, whatever's approved in the recreational district from the village, from White Sands, if people prefer to use that road. But the arterial road is built separate from Bayview Street. Thank you, Julie. I have Councillor Gender and then Councillor Grover. Thank you very much, Kyle, for all your input. I'm not really sure what your um, status is with the White, White Sands. So that maybe you could propose to them that they could uh, chip in on helping pave a little section of road. About three years ago, we were at a very public meeting and it was suggested. Didn't come across very well, but I would definitely ask you to try and uh, do a little bit of uh, manipulating with us on bringing forth that they come to the table with that. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Councillor Chander. Uh, Johan's not here anymore. Uh, yeah, she's mm -hmm. a bit of misinformation. Uh, I don't know of a road that's 16 meters wide in the county of Uh Highway two or Highway 56, which runs all the way through my area, is 27 to 28 feet because I had a bet we went with tape on it. That's 9.3 meters, and it sees a lot of traffic all all day long. So the width thing, I don't, it's what's underneath to make it a decent road, that Bayview Street, so that it can hold, hold the traffic in the traffic zone. Uh, our, our, uh, there was another thing there that they thought that the road launch is 48 feet. It's not, it's, they're all 66s, they're also hundreds, and those ones up there will be 66 feet. And that's from fence to fence in the county. Uh, and a road, 
actually it's $350 a mile to build, but way new us right, it's a million dollars mile to pave it, and then you got to keep it up. So I think, you know, if they do go to that, I think that, yeah, there should be off-site levy for the people that live there or use it. And the same with White Sand. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Grover. I have Reeve Clark. It's just, uh, as we talk about this and as we talk about future, like this plan is for the future. Mm -hmm. um, we've had comments here that everybody wants pavement. I put my house on a gravel road for a specific reason. I have Highway 852 running in front of my house now. And there's many days that I wish it was back to a gravel road because people drove slower. My kids could go to try to ride a bike on the gravel road, but we never let them out on that, on that pavement. Um, so there, there is issues with that. My other farm is on, on Highway 12, and I have semis pass me right beside each other when you're going down the road with farm equipment. So you have two semis pass you. So, the highway, the, the, the pavement part, we have to handle people and all throughout the county, as we said, we have 1800 plus miles of road and we have to handle the county and it has to be a plan forward. Um, and the construction costs, if anybody's building anything on the house, the construction costs and roads are much of the roof too. So we need, we need to be looking into the future on how we handle the traffic, how we deal with people. And as you talk definitions from when Joanne was here, Things do change, Julie, and, and things will change in the future. This is just, these people, are, we're only seven sitting at the table now, and that discussion can come up, you know, 10 years from now. So um, it's, it's we, we can only do what we can think we can do now and then go forward. Things are going to change. It's just the way things progress. And the lake is a definite example of that when you look at the social work. So that's, uh, I guess, my comment on the pavement and roads. Thank you. Thank you, Reeve Clark. I have Rick Green. It's a couple of points. So one thing uh, I keyed on when Kyle was talking is our, our engineering standards aren't necessarily hard and fast. And in transportation engineering, the rules are always open to flexibility uh, based on the environment and previous mixes that may have happened as things evolve into new uses. So when we look at something like through Buffalo View Estates, you know, the right of way itself may not be as wide as the standard definition, um, but there are a number of other factors and it's not, you don't have to meet all of the factors. And when you look at something like Bayview there, um, nobody's gonna put the speed limit up to an arterial speed limit through there. So when you lower the speed limit from say 80 down to 30, where it's at right now, you can make a number of other adjustments to standards to suit the environment. So it's not a hard and fast thing. Um, the other thing to consider regarding the arterial designation through there, it also tells us future on what we can allow against the road. And this, this can go for or against your argument, depending on how you want to look at it. But as an arterial, I look at that as not being able to improve on what's been done in the past, because it's already there, but it's going to keep us from allowing development, say, on the other side of the road that is accessed because it's an arterial. So going forward, we're gonna start controlling access as an arterial. So we're not gonna get a whole bunch more driveways on the south side attaching to the road like there is on the north side right now. Intersection spacing, also a function of speed limit. So at, you know, whatever it was, 400 meters or 800 meters between intersections, maybe at 80 kilometers an hour, yes, at 30 kilometers an hour, judgment gets applied to these things to the situation that's there. But think largely about what it's telling us about the future development and how that development is going to access the road network. And one of the big benefits I see of calling that an arterial is that we're not going to see a bunch of driveways added to it. If that makes any sense at all. Thank you, Rick Crane. We have Kyle Brook and Kate. Yeah, maybe I can just provide some additional clarification um, to, to the, some of the comments. Um, and, uh, you know, the point about uh, helping uh, convince White Sands to contribute, hey, I'm, I'm happy to speak to whoever will listen. Um, I'm just not sure how much sway I'd have, but uh, I agree. And that's why I said it. I think, I think it's in share, a shared interest, so it should be a shared cost. Um, and just when it comes to the road widths that I had mentioned, I'm just reading it straight off the, the, the county public works policy. 
um, for the drawing for Arturo Road. And I'm not sure, Andrew, if you can bring that up from what you had sent me. Um, I think it's the last drawing in the package. Um, and in this policy, you know, I guess I'm a little, I'm a little confused maybe because, you know, I hear that maybe the definitions aren't clear, but then when I read the county policy, it, it says all new construction of municipal roads or upgrades of existing municipal roads within the county of Stettler must be designed according to the county of Stettler standards set out in this policy. So if the policy said you must do it and there's a drawing that specifically shows what needs to be done, I, I guess to me it, it seems like the definite, it is fairly well defined. And, you know, as, as Julie pointed out, we talk about things and intention now, but in the future, that may not be understood and all that's known is, uh, is what's actually written in the policy. So I, I'm not sure why we'd want to compromise an arterial road design standard um, by trying to shoehorn it in to an existing road right of way when there's the opportunity to build a new one through land that is to be developed in the future that actually meets the standard. Because, you know, with with, you know, if White Sands ends up, it, it is the preferred access and there's potentially 875 lots uh, off the end of Bayview Street. Um, you know, we're talking uh, thousands and thousands of cars a day. The Paradise Shores traffic impact assessment for 750 lots estimated between 3,000 and 4,000 car trips a day. Now, if we're 875, what this plan allows for, plus uh, a bunch of White Sands residents, um, we're beyond that. And, and we are at the, what I understand the classic definition of an arterial road. So I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not saying, and I understand the economic constraints of paving the grid roads, and I know that's not practical right now, I guess what I'm saying is until there's enough development to justify that and cost sharing can maybe be negotiated with White Sands, until that time comes, I, 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 we, I guess we're really concerned that the existing infrastructure, i.e. Bayview Street, which has deficiencies already today, will have further traffic load added to it. So that's, you know, and that's why one of the solutions I proposed was traffic control on Bayview Street right now. But yeah, so this is the, I think this is the arterial road standard here. So these are the dimensions that I, that I have. Now, whether or not there's, there's roads uh, in the county like this right now, um, yeah, it says urban, but it's the only arterial road drawing. Now, and, Andrew, as you said, uh, specific regulations may trump and that's where if you go to the Red Deer Road Design Guidelines it does have rural arterial roads but then the right-of-way uh, increases to 40 meters. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the, yeah, this is urban. I thought we also had a specifically a multi-lot arterial but we don't. <laughs> or uh, a suburban arterial um, because, yeah, I, I don't think uh, this is an environment we would call urban as much as a suburban or a multi-lot. That's why we designed the environment going forward in the absence of standards. Yeah, certainly, um, I could chime in a little bit on this. You know, I get a chance to work with many multi uh, municipalities and you can find a whole host of definitions of arterials. Uh, yes, everyone may start with the general national recommendations but then there's a lot of tailoring to their individual climates and environments. So the definition from Calgary is very different than Innisfail's than in Red Deer's when it comes to an urban arterial. And I think that I think that what I've heard from the staff several times is there's an opportunity to customize something that will work here, uh, but it's not going to match the standard. So we have to choose a religious adherence to the standard or something that will work for the long term for this particular context. And I would encourage you to take the second option. 
Thank you, Craig. I have Councillor Nyberg and then Bruce Olson, and after that, Julie. And Kyle, if we get 875 units built out there, the um, 204 and 205 will probably be put in place for a building um, the road all the way to 601, which would take some off of there. One of the things that our standard does do is it puts the, the onus on any developer to build that road to that standard as well. So we don't have a developer or anybody for that matter. I mean, this isn't just your area, it's anywhere that a developer comes in and wants to put in a road, we say that it has to be built to that standard. So that's where we're at this construction. And I hear what you guys are saying about the whole idea that um, maybe the name needs to be changed or we need to do something here. And, I, and I'm, it's not lost on me for sure. But I, I do want to let people know, just if we change the name and if we do that, it doesn't change the reality of what's going to be going up and down that road. Um, people are, habit, are creatures of habit. And we do have to get it. it as, as the Buffalo View Estates builds out, there's going to be more and more traffic that needs to get out of everything north of Bayview Street. Um, realistically, I feel depending on how it, it turns out, um, you know, the, the traffic volumes coming out of Buffalo View Estates could be higher than what's coming out of that, um, the, um, what we'll call the old Paradise Shore site, because, I mean, if that gets built, I see people going down to, you know, not driving through the, uh, Buffalo View Estates, I see them traveling down 204 and then out onto 40-2. Um, that was our suggested path route to begin with. So that, I mean, I, I would think, and I can't speak for all of council, but I think that would be the future plans for that. The traffic you're seeing right now hasn't even taken that into account. So we're with that development, we could push them to 204 then to 40-2. Um, how that looks, I'm, I can't say. But if we get 875 builds out there, yeah, 204 will be put down to 601. So at that point, that's going to trigger some major infrastructure spending. Thank you, Councillor Nyberg. I have Bruce Olson. Um, just wanted to make a, a quick comment and hope that we can get on to another subject um, because I think there's some other pressing things that we need to discuss. Um, uh, I'm, I'm much more aware of the Bayview Street issue now, hearing all the comments and that in, in the 10,000 foot level, by just looking at the plan, it seems pretty direct that the county could save a lot of money by not making Bayview uh, arterial, put the arterial between sections, the, the section line between 17 and 20, that then it's like they say, it's been, it's going to be the cost of the to the new development that goes in there that's going to have to contribute to it. it to me, there's no question that that's a collector road just by the nature of, of what's there already and what could be there in the future. Uh, that's just my comment. I, 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 I think it might solve the problem. I think that the issue is the fact that it's defined as, a, as an arterial as opposed to a collector. Um, you have 204 and 205 as not as options already that that, that aren't there. So uh, why would that be a horrible option to just show uh, the line between the the section line between sections twenty and seventeen as the as the arterial? Thank you, Bruce. Julie Rattan. I think uh, j just to clarify my point about the the definition, why it's important. What we're we're trying to avoid is that our future, our, our grandchildren and future generations aren't sitting here 10, 15 years from now and trying to get rid of this bay arterial road definition on a Bayview Street because in the future, they're being told, well, that's what the plan says and that's what it's gonna be. So we're not speaking about today, we're speaking about the generations that follow. And I, I like Bruce's suggestion. I think that could solve a lot of problems and just leave Bayview Street as it is right now as, as a collector road. I, I, th I think that would solve the problem. Thank you, Julie. Justin Stevens. Um, 
quick question. I've been reading through uh, about about timing of infrastructure based upon future development. This doesn't apply to the current concerns. Um, in some places, it seems to be worded in parallel with development. In some places, it's prior. In some places, it's a year to two after. And I was just looking for a little clarification from from county as to if a substantial development went in, what would the timing of infrastructure be for that? Um, so that, that one's uh, fairly, I mean, there's a reason there's a few definitions there. There needs to be some flexibility. Um, On-site infrastructure is generally for the development. So if, you know, the, the collector road that's shown now uh, in the, the south half of 20, um, so say that that were to be identified as an arterial or just remain as a collector or whatever, and you want to know when that's going to develop, that one will develop when those two lots develop or when those two quarter sections develop. Um, that's, that's a pretty standard answer is um, on-site goes at the same time. Whereas um, the, the off-site stuff like Range Road 204, for example, down to 601, um, that's going to depend on how much money is in the bank, really. Um, likely after some of the development, but before all of it is done. Right? We're looking at that this is phased, or you know, this phase based on developer interest. So, uh, 204 might not develop until the you know south half of 20 is done, but before the the northwest of 21 has seen more development. Um, those are you know, it's it, there's no hard and fast answer, and that's why it's not um, hard and fast in the plan itself. Thanks, Andrew. Um, with nothing further in front of us here, Julie and Justin, your hands are up, but I think. Oh, sorry. Andrew's going to take it. Um, so our next item was Marie Lyle. Was that a group discussion or you just um, wanted to make note? I just wanted to make a note. So the, the Lyle land that's, that's northeast of uh, the Paradise Shores site was originally rezoned um, recreation facility with the Paradise Shores site. Uh, we're still sort of trying to touch base with the landowner to see um, if that's still their intent to leave it there or not. Uh, and there may be a, a change to that as, as required. Um, I don't want to either show the plan as recreation if that's not their intent, nor do I want to rezone them back to agriculture if that's not their intent. intent. But we, we do want to deal with it as part of the plan. Um, so yeah, if there was no questions on that one, we can. We see no questions. We'll move on to walking trails, which was item three. Oh, go ahead, Jacinta. You, you missed the boat launches. Are you maybe that was one of them? Well, we'll do walking trails and then boat launches. Sorry. Um, so I think coming out of some of our public consultation, there was just some questions about um, trails that may have been identified that uh, along the environmental reserve that wouldn't be our end. Tent to, to disturb environmental reserve. Um, it was an attempt to capture existing trails, um, but we will uh, re-review those. So if there's, there's walking trails um, in currently developed areas that uh, you think don't exist, uh, please give us a shout and we'll take a review ourselves as well. Um, so yeah, just, just all, all of my notes are things that I think may, may require massaging before first reading, uh, and those are some of the things. And just so everyone knows, it is our intent to be able to hook all the South Shore communities up with walking trails. Yeah. And we've got some land to acquire and um, hopefully that'll get done. Yeah, typically most of it, I think most of the stuff that isn't on the ground yet uh, is future development um, on undeveloped quarter sections now. Um, so that's where we'll see most of the connections occur. Any questions on walking trails before I move on? Oh, go ahead, Julie. Sorry, just confirmation, Andrew, really quick. Did I hear on the um, virtual engagement sessions that the path that you've identified along the shoreline in um, our area is going to be removed? Did I hear that right? I think that, that might have been one the one that was specifically brought up as an example that was put on the map thinking it was an existing subdivision or existing pathway that there wasn't an intent for, especially considering there's identified along the south side of Baby Street. I don't think that that was right. Okay, thank you. North side of, on the shore? No, no, yeah, okay. 
yeah, I think that was just that. That was one of the misidentifications we had. Okay, right. thank you. A lot of time, those pathways um, along the lake are underwater. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lake shore pathways are always um, tough to maintain. Maybe not this year, though. <laughs> <laughs> really big this year. Yeah. Uh, okay, no other questions on walking trails. We'll move on to boat launches. Yeah, so there were some general concern about, you know, why did we choose the locations we did? I think most of them were identified already under the Buffalo Lake IDP or the Buffalo Lake South Shore IDP. Um, and then, you know, some questions about what's going to define where exactly they go and how they look. I mean, our, our biggest issue is boat launches require a bunch of engineering. Um, they're going to work no matter where we put them and uh, a bunch of approvals work so um, they are very high level they're probably the biggest thing that require more detailed design um, to come after the plan and that was identified as part of the South Shore IDP as well that that didn't happen and and that's where I kind of look at my council now is that you know we need the resources to complete the next phases of engineering uh, that this plan calls for us to do and that's that's not a light light consideration we, we won't and can't approve the plan and then just put it on a shelf. We, we got follow up work to do. So I think there's probably other questions on the boat launch. Uh, Bruce Olson, go ahead. Um, we had sort of uh, broken down uh, uh, our comments in the sense of having certain people speak to certain um, items and uh, mine was boat launches. Um, one of the things that Justin did, uh, had mentioned that we'd done the survey and uh, boat launch is one of the questions on the survey. It was the one that came back as the most mixed or, or less uh, definitive. Um, uh, you know, the Buffalo Lake just wanted to make everyone aware that the Buffalo Lake IDP states that there is an access off of Range Road 211 and there is not. There is no boat launch there currently, never has been. So the, 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 the IDP is actually incorrect in that statement. Um, so I just wanted to make sure everybody knew that. And it identified all, you know, 14 sites or potential sites in, around the lake. But um, one of the big, big concerns is, is, you know, the infrastructure itself. And we've seen it in historically in past events that, uh, you know, where, when does that infrastructure have to be in place? Um, the, the, the plans suggested that you need an access point for every 700 uh, development units. Well, um, in in that regard, uh, there's only it's only on area C that really needs another boat launch in that side of it, and that sort of pans out in some of the discussions that we've had. Uh, on the communities on the uh, west side of 835, um, you know, we have our own seasonal docks. We, we have uh, uh, set up for, so basically you're putting your boat in, in the May long weekend, taking your boat out September long weekend. Uh, we don't have an issue with lake access for, boat la for a boat launch. Um, where on, you know, area C uh, on the east side, it, it's much more, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's more development units there already. Uh, there's lineups for boat launches, uh, you know, that are launching boats in, on the weekends and that kind of thing already. So it's much higher pressure there than it is on the, the uh, actual uh, west side. So, you know, from, from that side of the coin, um, you know, I, I, I'm kind of I know that the they needed to show the the uh, potential lake access points as part of what was in the the uh, Buffalo Lake IDP but um, we're also kind of uh, in that realm of saying well they like uh, Andrew said the uh, the infrastructure needs to be there and there's no study that the South Shore uh, on the west side of, of uh, 835 uh, the scenic sands boat launch is basically unusable because it silts in or sands in all the time. Um, the lake access, if it were to be attempted on Range Road 21-1, it's so shallow there, the cost would be astronomical to build it to the point where it wouldn't silt in or sand in again. Um, you know, those kinds of things. And to have them, when you read the actual uh, ASP, it 
it kind of says these are the locations it's going to be. Um, the actual IDP gives a little bit more latitude in the sense of the wording of it. Um, so we're kind of in favor of something of, because the studies haven't been done to making it a little more generic. I know we're trying to, to mirror the Buffalo Lake IDP uh, in, in what it stated, but um, from the practical point, it's really hard to define where they should be if you don't know. It wouldn't make any sense to have to put this huge amount of money into developing an access point just because it's on the plan. Um, so that was a sort of a big concern to us. Um, the, other, the other side of that coin was the, um, how it's worded in, the, the, in section 3.4. Um, it does sort of lead you to believe that those are the only sites, but the timing is also an issue um, in, four, in the policy section in 4.4.2. Um, it, it talks about when there's 50 or more is when it would sort of be looked at. Well, I think that's too, I think they need to look at it because it's too important to figure out if it's even feasible uh, as to where it would go. And then the other side of the coin is th that we did hear, or it, it's stated in the plan that uh, you need an access point for every 700 development units. Not exactly sure, and maybe Craig can, can uh, comment on that when I'm done, uh, where that came from. And, and like I said before, on the west side, we don't even have 700 development units. So uh, from that perspective, we don't really need one. Uh, and which sort of mirrors what our, uh, the, the associations on that side of the lake have said. So that kind of wraps it up, other than the fact that it would be um, nice to, to know what the plan is in the sense of, of when it would actually be put into place. Um, uh, if there is a way to better define it in the sense of if there's uh, say 50% of the remaining development units are are planned that that's when it would get put in or some some kind of uh, defining moment that would say it's not going to happen until we reach this point. So that kind of summarizes uh, um, our position and maybe sort of from a community point of view in the discussion we had last night uh, as a group. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Bruce, Andrew, and perhaps Craig are gonna weigh in on uh, on your concerns. And then we have Justin Stevens and Shree. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to, uh, one of the things I wanna, I wanna bring up that's a, a little bit overarching um, and, and kind of a part of the point of the plan. And this week's a bit to the arterial road to get to, uh, but the boat launches as well. Um, one, of my, one of my issues, and I always think about in, enforcement and appeals, um, because those are kind of some of my <laughs> biggest scopes here when it comes to the planning stuff, is um, if I don't have it in the plan, it's really tough for me to require it of a development, right? So if we don't mark Bayview Street as something that may need improvement, um, if I go to try and impose a development permit condition that says you're going to contribute monetarily towards it significantly, they're going to appeal it and they're probably going to beat me. Um, so I definitely need that. That's um, a, a major part of why the plan is, is required to identify the infrastructure. So the same thing applies to both launches. If all of the west side of 835 develops out and you know, you've got uh, hundreds more uh, lots now, and somebody, and, and I was never, I never identified anything, so I was never able to take uh, money to create a boat launch. Then all of a sudden, everybody's going to be saying, well, there's way too many people. The boat launches are, you know, even more overloaded. And I'm going to say, I'm tough. I don't have any money to build. Um, so I don't want to get into that situation ever. Um, so that's why we need to at least identify something. Um, as to the 700 dwellings uh, for boat launch, uh, Craig can elaborate, but I'm pretty sure that's more of an on the ground than a, uh, Suggestion or a guideline. Is that right, Craig? Uh, sure. The those it wasn't a standard to achieve. That was just the way the numbers worked out. Right. Uh, so uh, that does mean you take into account Old McDonald's private resort, which are a private launch, which we can't really replicate. So that's bearing some of the load for the development units that are allowed in this area in the future. So when we looked, took that group out, and we looked at three launches for the rest of the development units. 
it came out to that 750. And that's not to say that only 750 development units could actually use those boat launches. Uh, the other point I'll uh, identify, uh, the Buffalo Lake IDP, I guess I'd be more concerned about the mix or the interaction between the two plans that the Buffalo Lake IDP said, don't put a boat launch here. Uh, that would be definitely a clash or an inconsistency where the expectation is also that we use these plans of growth note platen to fill in more detail on how we're gonna go about providing this particular piece of infrastructure. That's what we're trying to achieve here. Uh, in terms of timing for the, and I think this may go to some of Justin's comments earlier that there's a lot of timing talk, especially in this particular area. Uh, that's because it splits the need to do a plan, the detailed design and see what the cost would be. How do you get deal with those silt issues? What is the actual layout and what kind of infrastructure or facilities are available at each location does have to get ahead of the first incidents where you're gonna need that. So you can make some choices on which one I would be ready to build the one uh, that you need. So when a major development proposal comes in that may trigger the need for a significant development permit review, a land use bylaw amendment or a, sorry, site plan or an, a land or local area structure plan or outline plan, that's not necessarily a, a fast process. An outline plan alone, a developer can spend about a year doing all the the studies in engineering and going through the, the approval process to do that. So that does give the county a little bit of time to say, okay, are we on the west side of 835 or are we on the east side? And uh, there it seems they're serious, they're going ahead with their designs. Where are we at with our details for the nearest boat launch? Have we started? Do we know a sense of what we're gonna do? And then you, the next stage you get into the, the timing of actual construction. Thank you, Craig. Um... Justin Stevens, you're up. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, this actually came as a comment in the survey, and uh, it was something that I hadn't considered, but I think has merit. Um, when we are doing the additional studies on the uh, lake access, um, the suggestion was made that we include washroom facilities at uh, potential lake access points. Um, it, it's, it, it's something that takes place at, at most boat launches, but it isn't spelled out. So I would like to point out that that is a consideration. Thank you, Justin. And we have Councillor Needs. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, um, just just looking at the boat launches um, on our Buffalo Lake Management Team Advisory Group, we're guided by the Buffalo Lake Integrated Shoreline Management Plan, and on there it allows us along the county so many boat launches. So when I hear that Buffalo Lake Meadows, that's not really a boat launch, and I know we took out scenic sands because uh, that was eroding away, and then I also hear that along Bayview Street that boat launch is not the greatest so so my question is i wonder do we look at other areas to put boat launches when we hear that the three of these are really not either in use or not built up or um or hard to access so i i would like to ask the group out there and and the rest of council too do we look at other areas uh to put these in because i know the government allows us so many boat launches and if we have um, these around the county that are not even built up or in use, what do we, where, where and what do we do to look at access to the lake on our, on our side of the county? I think that's a really good point, Cherie, because I, I, I think council and administration do understand the cost that would be associated to bring these identified areas uh, to make them usable uh, for the public as well as future development. I don't know where those other areas could be for boat launches, but uh, I don't know if anyone else has any thought about that. Um, I mean, we are even, not to give anything away, but there, there's talk here that we could maybe approach the county and see if we can make Buffalo View Estates, a proper marina for a backlot owners versus a boat launch. So there's lots of talk about the whole picture 
rather than just being stuck to those boat launch identification that are identified on the South Shore Area Structure Plan. Thank you, Julie. I have Justin Stevens and then Councillor Grover. Um, from, from a fiscal standpoint, uh, just on my knowledge of the lake, Buffalo Lake Meadows and Scenic Sands boat launch, I'm not sure that they could be stable without dredging out a marine. Um, the prevailing northwest wind makes it a broadside hit. Um, you get a tremendous amount of waves. In addition to that, the shoreline is a lot more sensitive there due to it being a lot more shallow and having a lot more aquatic vegetation, which would be if you if you channel uh, boater traffic there, then it will cause issues uh, to to the natural environment. And I'm economically speaking, I think the cost would be extremely high at those two locations to uh to add it without dredging out a uh protected marina and that that brings together some maintenance issues because it does slowly tilt off and may require dredging in the future so not only is it a very high initial infrastructure cost but it could be substantial maintenance costs on a semi-regular basis. Justin, I have Councillor Grover and then Kyle. Yeah, I was uh, I was over on that side. They'll just keep standing off unless they make a little marina for them to come into. And that's, we were talking a pile of money then. But one for uh, Craig there, while well, he's just sitting there looking. Uh, what's the uh, people for boat launch at Sylvan Lake and Gull Lake? Uh, you know, I, not sure I could actually do the numbers. You know, Sylvan Lake, you can argue that there's uh, two for all 100,000 that live in Red Deer that want to go close to the lake. <laughs> there's only two, two launches, and one of them is private on, on, uh, on Sylvan Lake. Uh, one's at the north end run by Lacombe County. Uh, it's, I'm trying to think what's comparable that you guys would recognize. It's a dual launch. It's actually in terms of actual facilities, it's pretty comparable to the White Sands launch. Yeah. I think just for the group to also think, I, and I appreciate the comments about the challenges of the site, each of sites will, uh, will uh, represent and the cost that will come with that. Uh, but I think one of the, the criticisms that happened previously was, this is a piece of infrastructure that has to grow with increased development in this local area, or that becomes a reason why we shouldn't be having growth and development in the area which is kind of how we circle back to saying, well, what can we do to provide for that increased uh, boat launch capacity? Or it's not always boat launch, it could be getting out with a snow machine in the winter too. Uh, hence the generic term of vehicular access points. Great. My question was, there's 110,000 people in Red Deer and how many are in Sylvan? Oh, uh, 15,000 now. There's more now but anyway. And don't forget the 25,000 planned around the lake in Lacombe County. They're not there yet. Uh, that's just oh, but they're still they're using what three no no they don't have three uh, uh, and i don't think their plans really they, they've done lake management and access studies over the years but there's really no plan as of yet that i've seen that says we're going to put a third significant public launch in this particular location well the other one isn't public okay go ahead good thank you yeah. thank you craig i have kyle brooke kate Hi, yeah, just a quick question. Uh, the previous uh, IDP, the South Shore IDP, had identified a boat launch at the end of Range Road 204. Just wondering why that was removed from this plan. So that would be right beside the White Sands launch. Yeah, I think it's just to the southwest of the White Sands, yes. Great big yeah. uh, water body to get to the lake. Yeah, so that one's got, got wetlands along the way to even get access to it. We don't have existing access. Um, and then additionally, as Craig pointed out, uh, location is also one of the issues is um, similar to the roads. Um, likely people will gravitate towards the boat launch that is closest to them. Uh, and so to have too high of a concentration of boat launches right side by side doesn't make a 
whole lot of sense. So that's where you see things sort of, sort of spread out. Thank you, Kyle. Do we have any more questions or comments? Uh, I have Bruce Olson and then Julie Rattan. Um, yeah, I just had a, um, it seems kind of obvious from the comments that it needs to be studied to make sure that it's going to be, you know, the, if the engineering work is done and it's going to cost uh, be a $5 million marina, I don't think any of us want to pay the, the, the increased uh, uh, tax that's going to have to cover that. So, um, so, you know, the need to have the, the actual engineering work done to say if it's practical or not. Um, what Andrew said kind of scares me in the sense if you don't put it in the plan, it can't be funded or, in, you know, along those kind of lines. That also could be interpreted from our side of the coin to say, well, it's put in the plan to be there, so we have to put it there. So that's the part that sort of scares me a bit. The IDP does, I think it's the, it's the third uh, bullet on one of the points that gives you the, the latitude to, to uh, find alternative sites. But um, I, I was just curious, and similar to what Kyle had just said, um, the Paradise Shore site, I thought they had to have, or there was a boat launch that had to be part of that site. Um, can somebody clarify that? Um, so just to the Paradise Shores boat launch, they, they were required to contribute financially uh, to surface upgrades uh, for um, uh, for a boat launch improvement. So it didn't have to be, they didn't dedicate land uh, or any specific provision. They didn't have to have uh, a private one, nor could they get a private one at this point in the legislation. It was that they had to contribute financially to an upgrade based on a, a certain formula that the board had, had considered. Oh, can't, can't, can't we add a, like, it kind of makes sense that if that's, is that not a logical place to put a uh, boat launch is if in on that site that's already sort of designated for a higher density? I mean, uh, there, none of them are without challenges at the end of the day. So it's, it's to council where, where you want to indicate them. We'd have to go through the, the water body see that that very expensive or we go to the other side space the boat launches out more use the ones identified in the buffalo lake idp and then you have the cost of dredging them out and making maybe burning them to make sure they don't sand in again and our point is that if if you know we're we're curious on the sense of demand if uh, sylvan lake has two launches for the the number that they have there uh, why do we need you know two in the area that in just in the area west of of uh 835 it, it, you know in, in fairness we we have heard quite numerously uh that you know white sand is already overloaded we need upgrades or more launches so um it's definitely something we've heard locally um that there is a demand for for more sub or for more boat launches sorry yeah, so putting putting one in the end of twenty one one doesn't really help White Sands a whole lot. Oh, but this is from our residents. Um, I think yeah. you have to remember the White Sands part is the head of future edition coming. So. Oh, sorry, Craig. Go ahead. But just um, you know, we do have to remember the the additional population load that's coming. So White Sands may be okay now. But maybe not so much when we add another 1,400 development units. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I think I cut someone else off here. No, nope, that's okay. And Julie Rattan and then Justin Stevens. I think uh, what's missing on here, sorry, I just got to plug in my computer. I'm getting a notice here. Um, is the Roshan Sands Village and Summer Village of White Sands Marinas. They are both need upgrades uh, to even handle what's here now, let alone the future. What uh, consideration or cooperation is the county proposing with those, with those villages to upgrade or to contribute to the upgrade? Well, the 
plan doesn't identify that. The plan is very geographically specific to the, the plan area, which exists only within our municipality. Um, and so it tries to identify all of our needs in case, say, White Sands and Roshan Sands said, no, we're not coming to the table. You've got a developer that wants to put in, you know, 200 new homes, but tough, we're not going to expand our boat launch at all. Go away. <laughs> Just hypothetically. Um, so the plan, the plan specifies that we can go on our own. Um, however, we're, you know, we're never closed off to intermunicipal collaboration. Uh, we've worked with, even as recently as just a couple months ago, worked with Roshan Sands and um, put forward some comments to make sure that they didn't uh, unnecessarily narrow the road that accessed their uh, boat launch. Um, and the, uh, you know, with the Paradise Shores expansion, there was generally uh, an intent that the uh, expansion, the funds that were needed to be dedicated could be utilized for the uh, enhancement of the White Sands boat launch. Um, so there's there's nothing in the plan that requires it um, because this plan is, is solely County of Stettler and we have to be cognizant that uh, the Summer Village of White Sands and Summer Village of Roshan Sands have their own governance structure and we can't, we can't force anything on them. Um, but that's, that's the main point. And that's why you don't see them even mentioned in the plan. I guess that's my point is since the, the so South Shore Area Structure Plan removes that cooperation between the villages, can we add, can something be added to the plan that says that councils uh, in the future or now will look at cooperation for opportunities to work with the villages for future access points? Can that be added to the plan? It doesn't, uh, Julie. We can add it, but the seven people that sit at this table can change that at any given time. We can't yep. bind the hands of a, a next council. Um, not always do councils get along as well as they should. So um, by telling the next council that they have to get along with somebody, unfortunately it isn't um, our preview to do that. So. I don't know if you have to say have to. There's lots of shoulds and mays here in the plan. so. I mean, it could be a should statement or may, uh, but uh, I, I'm, I just think we're trying to, when you talk about 2,700 new dwelling units at the lake in the future, whether it's 20 years down the road, to try to squeeze that into these existing points. And maybe it can't be done at this time. Maybe we have to take it off the table and just say, okay, we're gonna look at it and, and we're going to work together and 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 try to figure out how that all works. But um, I just think trying to squeeze it into what's existing there, public for the public and future developments, is is difficult. We could end up with two hundred thousand more dwelling units in the province of Alberta, and any one of those could use that particular boat launch. Right. They're, they're public access, and just like a public road, we cannot dictate who doesn't get to use it or who gets to use it. I'm sorry, it's just, it's real. Oh, no. We understand that, we do, yeah. Okay, I have Andrew and then I have Justin Stevens. I just wanna expand on on intermunicipal collaboration, um, you know, walk back on on what Councillor Nyberg said a little bit is the MGA does actually intermunicipal collaboration now through both our existing IDPs, but then as well our intermunicipal collaboration frameworks. Um, and so that ICF is what, it, what we shorthand it to. Um, the IDPs talk about shared planning infrastructure, shared, shared land use planning, whereas the ICFs talk about everything else, all our other services from uh, shared fire services to uh, other infrastructure that needs to be shared. And so I believe our ICFs have identified uh, boat launches and other shared infrastructure as a, as a uh, point that requires a new agreement within the next couple of years. So that's the, that's the framework that's already binding our council to uh, work through um, some uh, intermunicipal collaboration. And that actually does have a, a holistic dispute resolution process uh, built into it as well. So if we did have the, the white signs that wanted to say, no, go away, we don't want you here. We at least have a dispute resolution process um, built in through that so that we can try and find an agreement on shared services, um, no matter what they are. And ICFs are broken every day. Then, fortunately, we're put into them and taken out of them by other councils. It's happened throughout the province already. So, um, that discussion will be ongoing forever. The mediators, they got lots of uh, business. Thank you, Andrew and Julie. I have Justin Stevens and then Councillor Grover. 
Um, this is kind of just for information. Um, in my experience at the White Sands boat launch, which I use rather extensively, it the the consistent uh, shortfall or bottleneck is the uh, parking or lack of. Um, on a regular basis, boats and trailers line up along both sides of the uh, ditch along the road and onto private property, all the way up to the yield sign at the curb. That happens fairly consistently. As far as using the launch itself, that, that launch is quite well designed. You can get in and out reasonably quick. And I think the longest I've ever had to wait to get on to use the launch is a half hour. And in my mind, that's just a fact of life. That's, it, it's not a huge inconvenience. Um, trying to get off in emergencies, that's a bit of a different story. It has been quite a backlog in those scenarios. But as a general rule, the launch outside of emergencies is probably sufficient for current capacity. It's the parking, and that is the uh, fairly economical upgrade versus the uh, boat launch. And then I would like to also point out there is huge differences between uh, Buffalo and Sylvan. So I've talked to multiple people that uh, live in Sylvan and actually have, are uh, part of the Marina project previously. Um, they like to, they have a smaller lake that is incredibly popular and incredibly busy. So they create a bottleneck at the launches to limit the number of boats so it doesn't go over capacity. They are very heavily used, but they have also taken a diff different stance. They have built extensive marinas so that launching isn't as much of an issue. Whereas Buffalo is a little different situation. The bulk of the boats go in and out of marinas. Our, our, our marinas are fairly limited. I believe there's one at Roshan and one at Pelican and that's it. So it, it, it's a different setup when you could have thousands of boats docked at marinas the boat launch changes. And uh, regards to the 750 logs per boat launch, that changes substantially depending on what that development unit is. If it is a campground, uh, a, I guess a uh, weekend week type campground, they rarely bring multiple vehicles to pull trailers and boats, et cetera. Uh, seasonal or, or long-term, that's a different story. They like to have setups. They like to bring stuff. Whereas uh, subdivisions with lots, they more often than just conventional camp routes do have boats, if that kind of makes sense. Thank so, you, Kristen. I have Councillor Grover. Thank you for waiting. Okay. Yeah, just. Just for everybody's uh, thing, they call it Roshan Sands uh, Boat Launch, which is fine, and it's a wonderful thing. Same with White Sands. Uh, but they're public, anybody from Calgary, Edmonton, wherever, south where we don't have a lake, south of town, we can anybody can go there and launch a boat. And the last time that they did any work on the Roshan Sands on the county was a, we participated. It was quite a few years ago, but, and, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if you want to go building for $5 million uh, uh, boat launches when the ones that are there, I think, are handling what the thing, what, what, what it is. Yeah, the parking at White Sands is a problem. That's why I don't use it. I always use the Ocean Sands one. But uh, no, just to let everybody know that, that that's all public. Like, they can't stop anybody from going and using those uh, boat launches there that actually belong to the province of Alberta. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Grover. Councillor Neitz. Sorry, I stopped my video because of Wi-Fi. Um, I was just going to answer uh, Julie's previous question, which Andrew actually did. Uh, 
talking about the boat launches uh, around by Roshan Sands and White Sands and other areas, that would definitely be covered under our Buffalo Lake IDP and and the ICF. So those conversations are always going to be had, and and uh, and with the government too, they they get involved. So. Thank you, Councillor Neitz. I have Bruce Olson and then Neil. Uh, yeah, just quick comment. Um, it it would be great if we could add it in as be, because it makes it a much more public um, acknowledgement that that is an option, that uh, it doesn't have to be, you know, gun to the head kind of option to say that, you know, c contributing to existing boat launches, if more cost effective, might be an option. Uh, I'd just like to see that also written into the plan. Thanks. Thank you, Bruce. Neil Milne. Hi. Uh, yeah, just for clarity, going back to um, the village of Ocean Sands, there's actually, there's two launches there, one right in the bay, and then the other one is in the provincial park, separate from, I think it's separate from uh, the village of Ocean Sands. So just so that everybody knows, I don't know if that's an uh, easier avenue to follow with the, with the province on, uh, on a, a launch there or a, a marina? Uh, probably, I think you've got to deal with two layers now, Alberta Environment and Parks uh, from the lakeside and also from the management of the park as a long-term. And I'm not sure the, then the Summer Village of Roshan Sands is the, uh, the manager of the parks through arrangement, but I get your point. There is a, it looks like an attractive area, a single track launch there right now uh, with a breakwater along the north that looks like it could be expanded to a dual launch. Yeah, and there's a lot more parking there than there would be in right in Roshan Sands. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Neil. Okay. I think that might wrap up that discussion. And we do have a few more items to get through. So we'll move on to uh, community lots, water and sewer. Yeah, so there, this one should be quick. I think uh, th there was some discussion, uh, particularly surrounding undeveloped lots, um, being possibly required. There's a may in there, may be required to hook up when communal water and sewer becomes available. Uh, we heard that in, I think, two of the sessions. Uh, and basically, it asked, when, you know, are, am I going to have to be forced to hook up? And there was, you know, I had a very long winded gray answer for that. And, and it, uh, it boils down to maybe. Um, for uh, the bare quarters, farmsteads, acreages that aren't part of multi-lot subdivisions, um, those ones wouldn't, those, those would be the, the undeveloped areas. And it's possible that we could look at some language that, that clarifies that. Um, but I don't, I don't think it would be council's intent to make uh, acreage owners and, and farm yards connect. Uh, and particularly the other thing I wanted to point out too, uh, would be that uh, that does speak specifically to communal uh, water and sewer systems, um, not so much transmission lines, right? So if a, a transmission line goes by your house, that doesn't mean it's a communal water, sewer and wa water and sewer system, because uh, it's generally not actually designed for you to connect directly to. Um, so I, I, I think that might be something that can be taken back to residents. There shouldn't be very much, if any, forcing people to connect that are outside of developed areas. The, the multi-lots are still going to be a question that's going to be something that the councils have to determine the existing multi-lot subdivisions that are not communally serviced. If they're planning on bringing communal services nearby, they may want to consider the scope and the interest of the public in expanding that. And then at that point, they'll have to make a decision as to both costing and whether it, you know, you have to make people hook up uh, or not. And that's, again, that's outside of the plan. That one's uh, actually contained in our water and wastewater bylaw as to uh, what will happen. The, the plan more speaks towards uh, new development um, and all development shall be communally serviced, uh, as we've seen with a couple of subdivisions like Buffalo View Estates and Buffalo Sands. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Bruce Olson. Um, quick uh, question. The, the plan talks about, there's a lot of references to the Red Willow uh, Lagoon. Um, if I and I might be doing my math wrong. The, the, it says in there that it's got the capacity for 250 seasonal uh, dwellings. Uh, when I do the math on the, the, the areas it serves, it's, it's over 560 dwellings it already serves, or supposedly. Um, 
so it seems like it's horribly over capacity and and to be able to you know again we talk we've talked about this a couple of times about infrastructure being in place before development happens um this one almost seems kind of critical and there's been lots of discussion on um you know fecal matter in the lake and all kinds of things there too so might be a good sort of flag waving win for the county to say hey look we've got this plan just wondering if somebody could fill me in on is there a plan to sort of uh, heighten this as an engineer as the study and to to actually have a solution put in place before more development takes place because it seems like it's over capacity already. I mean, yeah, you give me you give me 10 million bucks, the first place I'm gonna spend it on is wastewater at the lake, honestly. But that's just for <laughs> reference. I gotta get counsel to agree to that. <laughs> um, because yeah, it's it, it, you know, all plenty of giving you ten million dollars, just so you know. <laughs> um, but that I mean that is you know, I say ten million dollars is probably not a far off figure. Uh, to service the whole lake. Um, Red, the Red Willow Lagoon's design specifications, I think uh, the, the 250 numbers comes from what it can handle with uh, evaporative losses strictly without discharging effluent. And so we do have some, I think, additional capacity there, but um, I'm not a wastewater engineer. Don't, don't quote me on that. Um, but yeah, it's certainly, it, it's, it's, it's a design pressure right now, for sure. Um, and it's, it's something council is likely going to need to turn their attention to shortly. Um, we've seen lots of, um, even, well, even Red Willow, you know, they've got a lagoon right next door. They don't have communal wastewater. Or do they? I don't think they do. No, no communal wastewater. Um, so, yeah, they're, <laughs> they're a community. They want to use their own lagoon. <laughs> and it's, it's largely contract haulers that are running that lagoon. So, um, yeah, not much of an answer there. Sorry. Yes, it's a priority, um, and it, it would probably be in what administration would would put forward as some of the the first phasing of additional studies is the wastewater because that's going to be a big one. Thank you, Andrew. Councillor Nixon. Yes, just to put it into perspective, the uh, Red Willow Lagoon was dumped once in the last fourteen or fifteen years of its existence, and that was just this past fall, and. Uh, and it's taken, you, you know, the lake for several years. Plus, uh, when the the Stettler Lagoon was being serviced, it took uh, the, the extra that you w went into the Stettler Lagoon used to go into the Stettler Lagoon as well. So it's it's got lots of capacity. Thank you, Councillor Nixon. No further comments on communal water and sewer. We'll move on to Julie Rattan. I just, I just want to clarify. I'm just making notes so we can let our residents know what's going on. Did Andrew, did you say if it's an existing multi-lot subdivision that if it's in the public interest, you may force people to hook up to wastewater? I don't know why people wouldn't do it, but is that your intention? Yeah. So it's within the water and sewer bylaw that if you know if a water line runs by you or a wastewater line runs by you, the CAO at her discretion can force you to connect. Um, but realistically, how it would roll out is if we're looking at putting in, you know, a pressurized line and a wastewater line, we're going to be going out to the community on public consultation for the project in general. And then council would have to make a decision then about uh, whether they're requiring connection or not. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. And so I see no more questions. We'll move on to the ERMR split question. Um, so that, yeah, there was another quick one. It was identified um, that the Buffalo Lake IDP uh, maybe wants a little bit more clarity as to how much will be ER versus how much will be MR. And that's something that we do have as a, a follow-up to, to define a little better. We don't have any, any answers for you yet. Um, but I think basically the, the topography and the, the layout of that land um, makes clear some areas that would be best suited as environmental reserve, and then other areas would be better suited as municipal reserve. So um, it should be... You know, originally we said, well, it's maybe something we'll get at the, the more detailed design. I think at this point, we, you probably won't see where ER will be versus MR in this plan, but you'll see approximate proportions. Um, and that, that will still vary from a local ASP or an outline plan level, though. No more comments on that? Sorry, can I just clarify what you mean by we will see proportions? What do you mean it for each... I'm, uh, I'm, area B, area C, or? 
and Craig may be able to further this to you a little bit, but I, as I understood it from our conversation, we would you know, be able to assign a you know a broad level percentage. You would see X percent of the lands of the reserve lands in the green on this map as as ER versus MR. Um, probably and the split between ER and MR is still difficult. What we can do is to say that the green that you see on that map, we just haven't given you an area calculation. We've indicated where it will be more most likely, and we expect more park space will be added because we haven't fully used the 10% MR that someone subdividing would also be expected to dedicate or could be providing additional park space as part of that. We also haven't included areas where a landowner may look at the slope and say, yeah, I could develop it, but I just wanna, I wanna put that as natural as an amenity. So that could be ER and MR as well. Defining whether or not it's MR or ER, we'd have to go to a lot higher level of detail than what we're doing right now. Uh, and that's so, um, that one I don't think is within our reach at this point. Uh, but we can give you a general sense of when you look across the plan area, are we talking about 100 acres or 400 acres of anticipated environmental reserve and open space area? Thank you. Okay, thank you. No further questions on this one? And we'll move on to the last item. Neil, Neil, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, just on that last comment or discussion. Um, once something is deemed MR and ER, um, what's in place to ensure that it stays that way so that, you know, it doesn't just for some other reason, somebody takes something from ER and turns it, or well, probably the county takes it from ER and turns it into MR. Okay. Um, so uh, you're assuming after it's been dedicated, the land's been given. Yes, after it's been yeah, dedicated. Yeah. So environmental reserve comes with a different set of rules than municipal reserve in terms of what the municipality can do with it. So an environmental reserve does mean largely leave it in a uh, natural state, but you can still build a public park in that. So that's how we actually pull trails through environmental reserve along lake shores or along river shores. Um, Arguably, if you had a meadow, you could convert that to a playground within environmental reserve, and that's the public park part. The municipal yep. reserve has a broader range of use, but it's meant to be um, significantly uh, manipulated to accommodate things like the playground, like a soccer pitch, uh, like even a, an outdoor arena. So active recreation, or sometimes it could just be a nice little garden with a, uh, with a park bench. So that range is quite a bit. It is oriented very much to public park space and where needed also to provide sites for schools and the recreation facilities that go with that. So, so I hear that, but how I hear that though is okay, so if it's ER, it's still ER, you just put a, put a, a park on it or some trails, correct? Yeah, that's right. But you couldn't put a school or an arena or a soccer pitch really on that. You can. Well, on the MR side, you may also be saving trees, but you're probably gonna have all your active recreation over there. And to go to your question about what prevents them from suddenly disappearing, is both require uh, under the MGA a public notification and a public hearing process before a municipality can lease, sale, or otherwise dispose of those parcels of land once they've been dedicated to the municipality. Okay, thank you. Thanks for your question, Neil. Anything further? No, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the last item I have is non-attached dwellings and proportion. Yeah, so the last item that came up uh, was the uh, uh, the ASP has a, a statement in the policy section that uh, no more than 50% of the dwelling units will be used for the non-detached or the non-standalone uh, you know, standalone residential type uh, uh, development units. So basically only up to 50% of areas B and C uh, together, so the 700 lots could be trailers, motel rooms, um, resort uh, type single lot developments. Um, and so there were some, definitely some conversation that came and some, some suggestions that came from the uh, groups on on changing that so that um, it can only be, uh, so that that can't all be put into one area specifically, that it would need to be split up. Uh, right now, the plan is built with the flexibility for the Development Authority or Council at the Area Structure and Outline Plan phase to say, well, this is a really good idea that needs, you know, this much and, and it's being done responsibly. Um, 
So it's, I mean, if, if council wants to vary from that and, and say they'll, they'll put additional uh, restrictions on that, you can, it's, that's entirely uh, flexibility versus expectations difference. Any questions? Um, yeah, I, I have a question. Um, regarding that 50% rule change potential, I, I believe this speaks to a larger issue, and that is uh, that the density, scale, buffering, and compatibility are all directly related because we feel that those, those are primary to that the wording from the overarching IDP is preserve rural lake lifestyle, uh, lake character, appropriate scale to be consistent with surrounding developments and maintains low visual impact. Scale of development shall be comparable to adjacent, appro appropriate site design and screening in the form of landscaping and or berming. Scale of development shall be comparable to adjacent, developer, and this is an interesting one, developer to dedicate MR for higher densities above the 0.9 uh, average. So that, that's laid out as an option in the IDP. And I think that is an interesting option that would potentially allow for some higher density development, but that dedicated MR could be used as a larger buffer to make it more compatible with the adjacent. And then the, the berming, screening, landscaping would mitigate a lot of the factors involved with higher density. So I think these, these four items need to be discussed as a group, we'll say, and not individually, because they're all directly related. I think that's a, a good point, Justin. So, and and that's one of the really big changes we see between the South Shore IDP and the South Shore Area Structure Plan is accounting for um, single lot development, like Paradise Shores, like a hotel, like a resort. Um, the South Shore IDP kind of had some blinders on the blinders of the day on were that uh, multi-lot subdivisions were the developments we were seeing happening. That's really all it considered. I, you know, it had bits of language in there, but it, it, it didn't really consider. So to say, you know, you need even the Buffalo Lake IDP saying you need more MR for a higher density development. Well, you're not taking MR when you're not subdividing. Um, so now the cell shore ASP has in the provision for these uh, community or the uh, not community reserves, uh, restrictive covenants and uh, identify or not, it's not even a restrictive covenant. Craig, can you help me out with the, the term I'm looking for? Uh, you mean in terms of a private development that's going to go through site plan and we're just going to have yeah. setbacks and preservation of areas? Yeah. So, yeah. Just through the site plan. Yeah. So, so through the site plan, uh, it can be required that, you know, that buffer area is bigger, wouldn't necessarily be an MR, it's still going to form part of the private property. Um, but the conditions attached to it are going to limit the, the density. And so that, I think speaks to what you're talking about, Justin, where um, the the density and the separation of uses and the buffers and this, the, the sight lines are more holistically considered then. Um, whereas it just, yeah, the, the, the cell shore IDP really didn't address that at all. Justin, we can't hear you. You just muted yourself instead of unmuting yourself. Sorry, Justin. <laughs> Never trust a piece of technology. You can't throw out the window. Um, uh, uh, what you're describing, I guess, matches my intent. It's, it's not that I'm opposed to campgrounds, resorts, higher density, but I believe that we have an opportunity now to strengthen some of the mitigation based upon lessons learned, we'll say. And, uh, and I, I relate back this back to old Mac and why I feel there was so much less controversy for them developing versus Paradise Shores. 
You're talking about hundreds of meters worth of buffer. You're talking about shelter belts. It's not visible from the nearest residential. It, it, and, and the, all those factors limited noise and light pollution and, and, and traffic and, and the whole, the whole gamut. Whereas if we can incorporate many of these things so that we can maintain that lake character. So you're not looking out your window at, at poor multicolored rusted sea cans. <laughs> it, 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 it would make a huge difference. So for example, at Buffalo View Estates, perhaps uh, that is relatively close to where the development was proposed. Um, if, if we went to say a landscaped berm with a walking trail or perhaps some shrubs or trees, similar to what you see at, uh, in urban settings uh, next to uh, roadways or arteries, Etc. It limits the noise. It, it offers residential privacy. It it does a lot of things to mitigate having this high high density next to the the low density. And uh, regarding the comment about municipal reserve, I, I'm not sure about the legalities of when it's required but it comes out of section 3.1.8 and it's just labeled as reserve. So I'm not sure if that's for all developments or strictly subdivisions or, or what the legalities are there. Strictly subdivisions. Fair enough. Fortunately, um, but now we do have better controls in place. And then as well, um, I mean, again, how Paradise Shores progressed being developed prior to approval uh, definitely created some of the issues that still exist there. Um, but I, you know, personally, I felt that this plan and, and maybe, maybe point to where if you think there's, there's areas where the language could be stronger. Uh, I thought this plan did a good job of addressing those uh, sightline issues, both from the lake and from neighbors, the buffering issues, the scale of development, it still relies on a lot of discretion. Uh, and that's just something you're going to have to see because, you know, Paradise Shores versus a multi-lot versus a hotel are all going to have such wildly different circumstances that will define what the scale looks like versus the, the appropriate mitigating factors. You know, in, uh, in Paradise Shores example, for, for instance, the, the Subdivision Development Appeal Board heard, heard a number of um, concerns about similar topics. Um, and ultimately, they didn't necessarily address them because they reduced the capacity based on the interpretation of the South Shore IDP. Um, and so, you know, I think you would have had, had they been going, had they maintained the higher density, you would have seen that that would have been the, the, the focus of that uh, development permit. I think going forward, you would see that similarly directly from our development authority as well. Um, perhaps it would be helpful if I gave you an example and then you could point me in the direction of, of where this plan would provide some controls or mitigation. So with the, with the old development, I inquired about landscaping uh, along the Eastern boundary. And I was told that that would be discussed and planned out during phase B. So now we have a situation where we have abandoned vehicles and the sea cans and everything else where the response is we'll deal with that at their next phase of development and I, I I'm not sure what would change to control that where yeah no uh, the entire site aesthetically matters not just one side or the direction of the lake yeah, so I think, again, that's going to come back to our land use bylaw changes. Um, when, we, when we talk about getting planning approval prior to undertaking work, those problems all uh, reared their heads prior to planning approval, um, which is challenging. Um, we have changed that in our land use bylaw so that uh, we won't end up in a situation like that again. Um, so that's, I, I would say that's less out of the area structure plan and more in general. And we want to see that everywhere. If G3 had started... Uh, without the benefit of development permit and started all their dirt works and the, the tens of thousands of tons of gravel they had to bring in, uh, there would have been some questions raised. Uh, but at the time, you know, our, our 
there were indifferent, the, the intent was there, you know, some, you know, starting a basement before you have your development permit was kind of the idea that a farmer could get going on dirt work on his own before the development permit was complete. Um, but that got abused and extended to the nth degree, so. I think, you know, when it's not a subdivision, even if it's a large development permit, and I hate making reference to Paradise Shores because we don't even know where Paradise Shores is going to be at. But you take a size of development like that. We're, going to, we're very interested in the site plan, the outline plan. And, you know, we're just not allowing site plans to come in on a, the back of a napkin anymore. I mean, they're professionally done. And you get the, the outlay and the look of the entire project, even if it's phased in. So um, those are some of the tools that we've helped get do it better so that council can make a better decision and answer more questions for residents. And then lastly, public consultation. That's the biggest one, right? That That's going to be the one where we can get some input from the neighbors and, and um, we've learned a lot. Uh, you don't, <clears throat> don't get real smart by doing everything right. So I'm not saying we're real smart, but we are smarter than we were. Absolutely. And I mean, now when a development like that comes our direction, we say, how much public consultation have you done? And, and just depending on the answer we get, it's, you know, get out and do some more. And the first thing residents want to see is what that development's going to look like at the end of the day. So those site plans, outline plans are huge now. They're probably the biggest part. And it's, the standard's been cranked way up. Um, I agree with you, Justin. I mean, the, the buffers, I, I laughed when you talked about the uh, four rusty sea cans because I see them every time I drive up there. But um, yeah, I mean, there should be buffer zones and you've always, you know, everybody's entitled to that enjoyment of their, uh, of their property. Thank you. I have Kyle Bruggenkate and then Councillor Nixon. Yeah, just a question, I guess. Um, with the way the plan's written right now, um, there's a de facto density limit or an indirect density limit on single family homes or detached dwelling units through the, the minimum lot size. However, there's no limit on multi dwelling unit properties. So my question is, why isn't there a limit? Um, why is that left unlimited for the multi dwelling unit properties? And can there be a limit uh, written into this plan? Uh, yeah, so, so yeah, the multi-lot, or multi, uh, having an individual lot, if you have a minimum size of minimum lots, then yeah, you've got, you've effectively got a de facto density, as you said. Uh, the main issue with, with putting that on multi-lot or non-multi-lot subdivisions um, is that the, the area isn't necessarily prescriptive of um, the use. So if you consider a motel, for example, to require 25 acres of space for a 50 acre, 50 unit motel, which would be that, you know, half acre per unit type idea. Um, that's doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, yeah, so that, that, that's, that's effectively the reason it's, it's about flexibility and in, in evaluating the, the development on the merits. Whereas when we look at the the multi-lot residentials, those lots form sort of part of what what you're selling. It's, 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 yeah, I don't know if that makes sense, but that's my, that, that's, that's the, the short of it anyways. Well, that, that does, you know, I, I understand what you're saying. Um, I'm just wondering if that really meets the intent of the Buffalo Lake IDP where, you know, generally it says it's to maintain a rural character. And the, the, there is a requirement for the growth node plan to distribute the density. So I just wonder if not talking about a density limit on a particular type of development really meets the requirements of the Buffalo Lake IDP. And, you know, it, it comes back to that 50% split between areas B and C again. It's just with the way the area structure plan is written right now, it does allow for a, you know, a 700 uh, RV unit site. And it may not be on 83 acres. It could be on less than that as well. Um, it could be on 70 acres. Um, so that's where I'm just wondering, you know, why could a reasonable limit 
be written in here so we don't end up with with something that's just kind of way out of whack of what the you know the character is and the the what the buffalo lake idp um says the the, the goal is It'll, that's something council you guys can consider um yeah or, or sorry reeve clark yes it's it's it'll just go in with the rest of the things we have to consider in this kyle but that's uh yeah we're, we're that's what we're talking about here is we're listening to what people have to say and and we'll have to make our decisions based on what our interpretation is of it. Hey, thank you, Kyle. I have just Stevens. Um, I think we can all agree that there would be a scale or density that would negatively interact with uh, the rural lake lifestyle, the lake character, compatibility, et cetera. And, and the, the nearest I can come up with a cap for, for a single development is that 700. And as far as density is the uh, county has some standards about uh, camp, camp ground lot sizes. I believe it was 20 feet by 60 feet. And then that would essentially set the only limits that there currently is to a resort or campground. And I would argue that if we were to get 700 in a 20 acre lot, that is incompatible. Like that, certainly we have to agree that there is a cap that would negatively affect these points that we're suggesting we won't negatively affect or change. What that cap or density is, is debatable and, and there'll be a varying opinion, but I, I think to ignore that that cap or, or limit altogether, it, I, I think is counterintuitive. I think we can all agree that at some point it will have an effect. So I, I do strongly feel that we should have some fashion of cap. And I believe that 50% rule to, to mitigate land sterilization would be a good one, if that makes sense. Justin, I have Councillor Nixon. I was just going to speak to the uh, the topic here a couple of questions ago, but the uh, a lot of those conditions are put on developments, as uh, Andrew has sort of and Yvette have already pointed out, and uh, and I recall our council here when uh, Paradise Shores, because that seems to be the topic, is uh, was had the original development plan. That was a concern of all the councillors, all seven councillors was buffering and things like that. So uh, this is a higher level plan, the area structure plan. Uh, when, when you get down to the development, uh, we have to uh, refer to our uh, land use bylaw. And all these things are taken into consideration and the conditions are put on, put in, put on at that time. Thank you, Councillor Nixon. We have time for one more comment or so, and then we need to wrap up. Uh, Julie? Uh, I'm just going back to the wording of that 50% uh, com the combined area of area B and C, 50% should be detached dwellings. What, why did you word it that way? Why, what we're, I guess what we're looking for is, um, I think Justin brought it up in one of the virtual sessions that can we change this so that the wording shows that 50% in area B and 50% in area C should be detached dwellings. Like what was the intention of wording it the way it was? Oh, so maybe I'll field that one, I'll give Andrew a break. Uh, largely to maintain flexibility. That's it. Does, do you still get flexibility by changing it to reflect 50% in each area. Yeah, you'll have less. So basically if you manage each as a small pool, then uh, effectively what you are gonna be doing is reducing the size of any single large uh, recreational vehicle or campground oriented development in the future. 
which is... I assume is, is why you're interested in that kind of change. Well, it does, in a, it does help give us some comfort that, you know, Paradise, I, and again, I, I don't want to say Paradise Shores because it's not that anymore, but that recreational area in our neighborhood, you know, the potential, it, 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 might, it might only have 450 units instead of 700 or 425. And I think that's reasonable. People, that's a reasonable expectation that in 80 acres or 70 acres, if you take out MRs and playgrounds, 400 sites, you know, hey, we can work with that. But it's it, what we're trying to stop is a large concentration of dwelling units in a small area. And I'm not feeling that um, the South Shore Area Structure Plan addresses that concern. Yeah, just going on the flexibility idea. So um, where, and, and I see what you're saying, you know, 400 seems about right for Paradise Shores maybe on 80 acres. Um, but if we, if we move to the wording you had and say Paradise Shores doesn't happen, uh, but down the road, somebody wants an amendment for the, the lot straight south of it, and they've got 160 acres now, they'd still be limited to that 425, and maybe a more responsible number can be higher than that uh, on 160 acres than it can on 80. Um, so that's where some of the flexibility came from. I wouldn't, you know, the, the, there's also potentially compromise points in the middle, right? Like, to be beyond saying each gets half, it's maybe there's a maximum. That's something council consider uh, mm -hmm. separately. Um, but ultimately, I mean, I keep going back and I feel like a broken record sometimes, but it's uh, this, this plan does keep some flexibility to judge every development on the merits of the development. Um, and I, I know we had a bit of a bad experience because of you know the, the, the last development, but I, I do see how those standards have been reflected in so far across the entire county um and and i do believe in that so it's it's why you know i'm always hesitant to say yeah absolutely just build the plan and develop it for you uh you know we, if we bought up all the land at the lake we could make a really great lake but we can't afford that you got to be careful too that as council moves forward and future councils move forward that you have a ba good basis for them to work for if you keep restricting it um, it's going to be tougher and tougher for them to make a decision and depending on what type of development comes forward I mean it could be just the greatest thing in the world and yet you got to go back and amend the plan to allow for it and you know uh, it could take a year you could postpone that for a year and and that it's a, it's a double-edged sword be careful for what you wish for because if we say that it's only 50 percent single dwelling units um, that's all you get maybe somebody comes in and wants to put 600 one acre parcels in and we can't give it to them we have to hold those units for a recreation facility so it is a double-edged sword and i uh, i mean that flexibility is something that i'm i i get what justin says makes sense but it also is a double-edged sword for us in that sense that um you could be taking away uh, a much more desirable um development going forward. So if somebody came in on that whole quarter section and wanted to put, you know, however many houses in there on half acre parcels, we would be stuck because we wouldn't be able to give them, we'd have to hold them for the campsites. So that's not always a, a good thing either. Hey, thank you, James. Uh, I have Kathy Hankins and then Kyle Bruggenkate, and then we're gonna need to wrap up today. Um, I, I just have Kyle go ahead, ahead of me. I just want to make, well, I'll just put it this way. I was looking back here on the survey and I think the whole, uh, and I'm sure council gets it, but I just want to reiterate that the whole problem that we've had in the past and that people are concerned about is density. Out of 174 responses, 163 strongly agreed and agreed that density and scale are the primary concern for development. And I'm sure council gets it. I've heard Councillor Nyberg 
mentioned several times that we've learned from the past and let, can't do anything about it. But let's just make sure going forward that we're not listening to the what the residents have to say. Thank you. Kathy. Kyle? Yeah, I just wanted to, I guess, put out there some comparables when it comes to density around campgrounds and RV resorts. I, I took a look at 11 different resorts around central Alberta, uh, quite a wide variety. And only three of the 11 had a density greater than three campsites per acre. So just to give a, an idea of what a comparable number is for other RV sites and campgrounds. And just as an interesting aside, the three RV resorts that did have higher density all had paved access to them. So a little tongue in cheek there. But um, I mean, even Old McDonald currently is 2.9 campsites per acre. Now, when they go over to 800, it's more than that. But currently, just for reference, they, they're 2.9 sites per acre. So that's where I think there can be some reasonable limits put in place because all these other um, resorts seem to operate and, and be successful. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, so I think that's it. Uh, we're going to wrap up for today. Um, thank you for joining us. Every, every one of you, we value your input and we certainly value your pre-planning and your preparation, which allowed us to get through so many topics today and so thoroughly. And uh, I know council appreciates that you divided and conquered um, so that they could succinctly understand what your thoughts and uh, ideas are. And uh, again, you have until May 17th, if you think of, of more things or have final input to provide to us, please do so by the 17th of May. After that time, we're gonna be um, workshopping and looking at this a little bit more by the end of May is what I understand. Um, so again, thank you and uh, enjoy your evening. Thank you. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs>